What do you get when you combine a pathologically lined sociopath, pedophilia, some tenets of Islam, an Egyptian theme park, dreams of becoming a disco and R&B star, lots of hard-to-understand quasi-religious UFO teachings, concubines, and so many dildos? You get Dwight York and the Nawabian nation of Moore's cult. Born in 1945, Dwight York would grow up to become a cult leader. Like most cult leaders, he abused his followers in a variety of ways. Using the language of the Islamic separatist black nationalist groups around him, York found a way to build a community in Brooklyn that he controlled by giving them incense and his terribly written books to sell, then enforcing a lifestyle on them where they had to live separately from their families and basically devote you know, all their time to making York some of that cult money. While they worked for him, Dwight York was often having sex with their wives and not secretly. Part of the price you paid to be in this false prophet's cult, to live on this maniac's Egyptian compound. Later, he'd be having sex with a lot of their children as well. He did try to keep that a secret, but many knew about it. And still later, he'd be having sex with his own children. Dwight York was a demented, perverted bastard with one hell of a gift for spitting out so much crazy bullshit that somehow made sense to the hundreds of people who trusted him with their lives. And for a while, he did seem kind of trustworthy. His buildings in Bushwick were some of the few in a rough portion of Brooklyn that weren't riddled with crime, drug use, and violence. Of course, inside their walls, life was not so crime-free. The man once known as Dwight York was already likely abusing children and abusing followers while expanding his cult empire. He soon bought property in the Catskills, where the child fucking took off full force. He'd basically escape upstate whenever he wanted to have relations with a van full of teenage Backstreet girls, given that name because they hung out in his Bushwick recording studio called Backstreet. After far too many years of this, the feds finally started snooping around. Dwight got nervous. York would then move again and get way, way off the grid. He'd move his whole cult way down south to rural Putnam County, Georgia, where he dropped the act of being a Muslim prophet and start preaching that he was a celestial being sent from the planet Rizik to save a select group of his followers. He even preached about the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki, the space lizards. He went hard on ancient aliens long before it was cool. He even preached about giants. And he got real, real into ancient Egypt too. Started dressing like a pharaoh. Had some big pyramid replicas built in a sphinx. There was so much insanity unpacked uh, to unpack in this story. So many fake names, so many fake stories that Dwight York made up about himself to convince people to follow him. Thank God today's horrible tale does kind of have a good ending. The bad guy does a lot of bad stuff so much, but then he does get caught in the end and punished for his crimes. Dwight York would eventually see justice way too late for too many victims. Better late than never, I guess though, right? 2004, York would be convicted of numerous counts of child molestation and violating the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. He is still serving in uh, his 135-year sentence, a sentence that should have been even longer, maybe like a 1,000 years. York's case was reported as the largest prosecution for child molestation ever directed at a single person in the history of the United States, both in terms of total number of victims and total number of incidents. He's 75 as of this recording, and he has over 115 years to go. So real unlikely he'll ever get out. Unless he's the Egyptian alien he once claimed to be. Telling such a messed up story today. So many horrific facets to it from York's belief system that preached that black people are genetically and morally superior to all the other races, especially white people, to widespread childhood molestation, to the fact that so many people wasted so many years of their lives falling for York's preposterous lies. Are you ready to go full cult, cult, cult? Let's get into Dwight York and the Nuwabian nation of Moors on this week's Egyptian, alien, polygamist, ludicrous, black supremacist. I wish I could visit this guy in prison just so I could punch him in the fucking face so, so many times edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, meat sacks. Welcome, first-time listener. Welcome back, long-time listening meat sack. Uh, to the cult of the curious. We're a very easy cult to be a member of. I don't have pamphlets you have to read. Don't have any meetings you have to attend where I'll start bending your mind and preparing to pressure you to say goodbye to your current social circle, sell your belongings, uh, give all your money to me, come live in my compound where I'll, you know, fuck you as my cult slave. This cult is mostly just about sharing crazy tales uh, that you can listen to at your leisure. And boy, do I have a very crazy, entertaining tale to share with you today. After a few quick announcements, uh, I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master, Whipple product tester, Lucifina lady ween fluffer, dog the bounty hacker, tech advisor, servant of, Nim servant of Nimrod, and you're listening to Time Suck. That was a lot, as usual. A uh, new very culty Hail Nimrod tea in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Got, got kind of a, a Bible school vibe to it. Uh, feels right for this episode. Uh, I want to give a quick thank you to our Patreon space lizards for allowing us to donate $14,400 to support surfside.org. 
a hardship fund just established by the Miami Heat basketball team to help those impacted by the devastating building collapse in Surfside, Florida this past June 24th. Please head to supportsurfside.org to learn more. And that's it for the announcements. Real quick, flew through them today. Now we're off to explore the wild tale of a cult with a leader as sexually insatiable as Fred and Rose West from two episodes ago. The man of many names, born as Dwight D. York, he would molest hundreds of children. Hundreds! Almost all were members of his cult. Uh, for many years, he split up families, sexually abused women and children, took people's money, took everything from them, and made them live in terrible living conditions, uh, working 12-hour days, all to support him while he lived like a god with a literal harem composed uh, by the end of mostly underage girls to attend to his every need. York preached a version of Islam, at least initially, but he'd never lived the kind of modest, uh, pious Islamic lifestyle that he preached about and forced his followers to abide by. When he got tired of being a Muslim prophet, uh, he switched it up, focused on his disco, R&B career for a while. And he started talking about a bunch of uh, ancient alien Egyptian jibber-jabber. It's unbelievable what kind of crazy pills he was, e he was able to get his followers to swallow. Holy shit. Uh, his greatest gift may have been for pageantry and costuming. He knew that people loved to go all in on an idea, whether it was Islam or ancient Egypt. And he knew that if he got them excited enough and fully immersed in the current idea, they'd kind of forget about how his new idea was nothing like the idea they'd signed up for. He took things a lot farther than some of the other batshit cult leaders we've covered, like the Children of Thunder or the Angels Landing cult. Dwight York was more on the level of Tony and Susan Alamo. He had his followers build him a giant theme park type complex on almost 500 acres in Putnam County, Georgia, named Tom Array, where followers from all over the country flocked to spend Tom Array money with Dwight York's face printed on it. He sold his followers on the idea that he had built them their own sovereign nation inside the state of Georgia, which you can't fucking do. Uncle Sam kind of frowns on folks establishing sovereign nations inside his borders. Most countries don't really care for that. But York got his followers to believe that lie. That, he, that was his greatest gift, selling lies, making the impossible seem possible. He was scary good at that. This crazy horseshit went on for over 20 years, almost 30. Dude ran an insane cult for more years than Michael Jordan played basketball. And that counts high school, college, and the NBA, even the strange Washington Wizards years. During that time, York hurt hundreds of people emotionally, financially, sexually, physically, so much nonsense to unpack today. Uh, if you're a first-time listener and, and you don't find this story entertaining, well, you might truly want to go find a different podcast now because the crazy-ass stories I tell do not get much more captivating than this one. All right, going to give an overview on this guy. Uh, overview of his beliefs, the Nuwabian beliefs, the uh, beliefs of the Nation of Islam, where his... Uh, he was initially influenced to kind of start his cult teachings, and then we'll get into the timeline for the rest of the show. So another pretty straightforward narrative. Uh, Dwight York would be defined as being many different things after his public arrest in 2004. Most prominently, he'd be presented as a preposterously active pedophile, and he definitely was. According to Bill Osinski, who wrote a 2007 book about York and the case, a source we relied on heavily for this research, when York was finally indicted, state prosecu prosecutors literally had to cut back the number of counts listed from well beyond 1,000 to slightly more than 200 because they feared a jury simply wouldn't believe the magnitude of York's evil. It is believed to be the nation's largest child molestation prosecution ever directed at a single person in terms of number of victims and number of alleged criminal acts. How fucking crazy is that? They cut back the number of charges because the truth was too unbelievable. He was so monstrous, they didn't think the jury would buy the real story. Imagine that with a serial killer. It appears he's killed around 1,200 people, so let's charge him with, uh, I don't know, 70. Still plenty to put him away forever with, and, uh, you know, a little more believable. York would also be defined as a Muslim, which he kind of was for a time. Uh, he led a group in Brooklyn in the 1970s called the Ansaro Allah Community, or the AAC. On the outside, the AAC looked kind of nice, and in some ways it was. Their compound of buildings was one of the only stretch of buildings in the Bushwick area of Brooklyn that wasn't plagued by violence and crime, but on the inside, he was building a, a cult he trained to regard him as a god, you know, creating his own personal empire over which he exercised dictator, dic, dictatorial, there we go, control. He'd be defined as a black supremacist, as were those who followed his teachings. Very true. He and his followers made no point of denying this. He and his Nuwabians proudly stated that white people's lighter skin color was the result of leprosy and the fact that their ancestors mated with dogs and jackals. <laughs> and as a white guy, <laughs> okay, I gotta say, there is some truth to that claim. Look, I, I can't claim to speak for all whites, but if you were to go find me on Ancestry.com and check out my family tree, 
you will see that about mm, three generations back, that's when the dogs start showing up. Mostly bloodhounds, couple terriers. Uh, you go back eight, nine generations, that's when the jackals first appear. You know, it all started with my great, you know, uh, time seven, Grandma Myrtle Cummins. She went on a trip to South Africa to work on a farm just east of Johannesburg, and one day she disappeared, all right? And when she showed up about a month later, I'll be damned if she hadn't gotten married to a fucking jackal. It was real hard on my family. The jackal didn't speak any human languages or understand any human social constructs, uh, and sometimes my pappy jackal would do stuff like shed on the living room floor or eat one of my Grandma Myrtle's smaller nieces or nephews or cousins or, you know, aggressively fuck Grandma in front of company. You know, just jack, just jackal being a jackal. <laughs> White people, am I right? Uh, the Nawabians really did not care for Whitey. In one of his many, many lectures, uh, Egypt and the Mask of God, uh, York would say, "White people are the devil." They say the Nawabians are not racist. Bull crap! I am. White people are devils. Always was. Always will be. Fighting racism with racism. Good way to keep racism alive and well. Uh, in addition to being super into racism, York was also super into disco for a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just took a left turn into uh, disco. He was a member of a moderately successful R&B and disco band in the early 80s called Passion. <laughs> they, were, they were only around a few years and released only one original full-length album. Uh, Leon Pindarvis, keyboardist and occasional band director for Saturday Night Live since 1980, was another member. What a weird connection, right? Uh, Dwight also released a few solo albums after Passion broke up in 1985. He dropped some fire called New York. Get it? It's a new album from Dwight York. Recorded in New, York, in New York. Okay. Uh, I do have to give him props for having a smooth voice. He's no James Ingram, but he throws down a nice hook around some sax riffs. And, uh, and you know, he's got a decent drum machine going in, uh, uh, in the back of a plane as black and white. Let's hear a little bit of this ear candy. Plane as black and white. Mm-hmm. Oh, here we, oh, 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 here we go. Okay. Oh, maybe could have jumped in now. Uh, okay. There we go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Like buttered velvet. So smooth. Come on. There he goes. Oh, sing it, Dr. York. Plain is black and white that you're a fucking maniac. Uh, when he wasn't being racist or working on his music or kind of following the teachings of Islam, but not really, or molesting so many kids, uh, he was often working on coming up with new names for himself. Over the years, he'd be known as Dwight York, Dr. Malachi Z. York, Isa Muhammad, uh, Issa Hadi al-Mahdi, uh, Issa Abid ala Muhammad, uh, Baba. He'd use professional names like Dr. York, Dr. Love. <laughs> you know, for his smooth disco R&B songs. Uh, most of his followers called him Doc or Pops. Uh, in literature, he was known as Master Teacher, The Reformer, The Lamb, Chief Black Eagle. Uh, one of his alien names was Avatara. I think the longest uh, alias I found for him was Iri I Saeed Al Mumbra Isa El Haji Tundi, The Divine and Noble Black Fellow. <laughs> ah, that's a very unlikable name. Nothing good's coming from a dude with 14 fucking words in their name. <laughs> I, know they, I know they say never say never, but you will never have a consistently good time with that motherfucker. You get a house guest with 14 words in their name. I think you're best off just showing them the door as soon as possible. Hello, my name is Iri uh, Saeed Al Mumbra Isa El Haji Tundi the Divine and Noble Black Fellow. Hey, wh- why are you holding the door open and gesturing for me to leave? I've only just entered. Yeah, I just don't really care for your name. W- what's in a name? So much in your case. Now get the fuck out, Captain Horseshit. Uh, Dwight York, so many things. He was an enigma, even to his followers. He kept them guessing, kept them intrigued. Also, you know, kept them pretty confused. I watched a local news reporter interview a man acting as his spokesperson at his Georgia Egyptian compound in the early nineties before it all got shut down. And you could tell that he, uh, you know, one of York's most devoted followers, I'm guessing to get the spokesperson job, did not know how to properly explain what the fuck York is about. Like he just fumbled around so much. He couldn't decide if York was a religious leader or like an alien or both or neither He gave a lot of confusing and nonsensical uh, nonsensical responses to the reporter's simple questions because York was a confusing, nonsensical man. And how did this psycho-babbling bullshit artist get people to follow him? Confidence and charisma. Dude had a presence. He won over converts mostly thanks to his charismatic rhetoric. York was a talented orator. 
His followers loved his intense speeches, the way he delivered lectures of vitriolic hate, but with timing that made it almost comedic. The solemn look in his eyes, the fact that he claimed that everything he did was all for the children so they wouldn't have to grow up in places plagued by crime and violence and racism. They may not have always understood what the fuck he was talking about, but they liked the overall vibe, the feeling he gave them. They felt like he knew a lot of secret spiritual knowledge. He was chosen by God. Maybe he was God sometimes. He had their best interests at heart and it pleased God or pleased him, you know, whatever for them to follow him. They believed he'd lead them uh, through a righteous life, free from the white man's bullshit. And for many of his followers, that was enough. He said, cool shit. He was a man of God or maybe God. Uh, a lot of other people seem to understand and believe in York around them. You know, peer pressure is a motherfucker. It can go a long ways towards conversion. And uh, he made him feel good. You know, where are we heading, fearless leader? I like, I like what you're selling. I like being part of this little crew you've put together. Us versus them. Us versus them. Uh, he made followers feel like they just entered the Club of Life's VIP section. His followers, despite his ever-evolving and highly confusing theology, they trusted him. And we're going to dig into that uh, deeply. Uh, they trusted him wholeheartedly. And having that trust enabled this piece of shit to molest kids as young as four. Four! And get so many followers pregnant. He had an estimated 200 kids of his own by women in his cult, many of uh, uh, them with, you know, underage women. Young women seeing local doctors in Georgia because they were pregnant was uh, what helped tip off local authorities to illegal activity going down at the Nuwabian compound. He was fucking damn near everyone in the compound. He was living uh, Fred West from two weeks ago's Ultimate Fantasy, having a giant compound of people to fuck, not just a family, and the occasional neighbor or stranger. York assigned his male followers mates, but even then he still fucked their wives whenever he wanted. And how did he get away with all this? You know, how couldn't they see what an insane, manipulative, and downright evil man Dwight York was? Well, I know I said charisma and confidence earlier, and that did go a long ways, but black supremacy also helped him a ton. This, this concept, York was really good at promoting an ideal of black supremacy to the desperate and the downtrodden, to people who did not feel supreme outside of York's orbit. Let's explore the concept of black supremacy groups a bit. Haven't done that since the nation of Yahweh cult suck, another black supremacist cult. Let's, uh, remember Yahweh Ben Yahweh? Oh my God. Let's check out how York, like Yahweh Ben Yahweh, aka Hulan Mitchell uh, Jr., figured out how to weaponize the suffering of black people throughout history to make them believe in a Messiah figure. An aspiring art student in Florida, Diallo Seabrooks, who fell for York's bullshit, would later say, we've been taken advantage of for so long, we're always looking for some savior or Messiah type person. Ultimately though, Diallo said, we were slaves. The only difference was, it was a black man running it. York preyed on the idea that no one would accuse a black man of enslaving black people. And he blatantly did just that. Now, these tendencies would, would not go unexplored by social scientists or have, have not gone, uh, who would do so as early as 1944, uh, before uh, Dwight was born. Arthur Huff Fawcett, a black journalist and scholar, wrote Black Gods of the Metropolis, Negro Religious Cults in the Urban North. One of the cults he studied was the Moorish Science Temple, the forerunner to the Nation of Islam. We'll get into them in a bit. And in Fawcett's book, he found that black cults flourished in big northern cities, you know, like in Brooklyn, uh, where they held almost no traction for black people in the South. This was because despite segregation and discrimination in the South, it wasn't uncommon to find black people who had been able to amass wealth and influence. Black people who moved to the North, on the other hand, were frustrated to find the barriers to economic progress were only slightly lower than those in the South. Fawcett listed five factors in order of importance which he found attracted people to black supremacist cults. One, personality of leader. He had that in spades. Two, desire to get closer uh, to God. He sold that desire. Three, racial or nationalistic urge. Oh, he was big with that. Uh, four, dissatisfaction with Christianity. Definitely did that. I'll talk about that in a second. And five, miraculous cure. Decades after Fawcett's study, these factors worked to pull people into Dwight York's cult and sort of foretold its end. Uh, in an interview with one former member, she spoke of being disillusioned with her Christian church in part because of the images of Jesus and the apostles were all white dudes. They didn't look like anyone related to her. And then when York spoke of a black Jesus and other black prophets, that imagery did speak to her. And in regards to Fawcett's belief that it was easier to attract black cult members in the North than it was in the South, uh, York would have, you know, a lot of success in Brooklyn, and upstate New York. And then things, you know, would go South down in Putnam County, Georgia. Also, when he uh, was getting started, the time and place was right for the message he preached. York, York, excuse me, exploited racial tension in New York City in the 1970s. In New York at that time, numerous militant Islamic separatist groups were going to war with law enforcement uh, and each other, especially the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam would be an important influence for Dwight York, who would adopt some of its teachings, and the environment the Nation of Islam created would allow York to commit his fucked up deeds for so long. We've, we've summarized the teachings of the Nation of Islam numerous times in several sucks previously that have covered the NOI directly or indirectly, worth peeking at them again to get uh, further prime for today's info. So the NOI, it's a religious organization founded by Wallace Fard Muhammad in the U.S. in 1930. 
Since its founding, the NOI has grown into one of the wealthiest, best-known organizations in Black America, offering numerous programs and events designed to uplift African Americans. While at first seeming like a group built on Black empowerment, a good thing, the Nation of Islam preaches a lot of horrible and incredibly racist ideas. Flip their ideology by replacing what they preach about Blacks with whites and vice versa, and they're not that much different than the KKK in many ways. At its core, the NOI has espoused and preached a Muslim theology combined with the belief of the innate black superiority over whites, a belief system vehemently and consistently rejected by mainstream Muslims. Louis Farrakhan, not a good dude, and other leaders have given speech after speech full of deeply racist, uh, racist anti-Semitic, and uh, homophobic rhetoric. Doing so has earned the NOI a prominent position in the ranks of organized hate groups in America. Here's a summary of some of their uh, interesting beliefs. The NOI claims that the creator of God or excuse me, that the creator God, Allah, uh, took the shape of a black man. Then he died and then has had several mortal successors. The Islamic prophet Muhammad being the most recent, it teaches that the first Allah uh, created black people as the earliest humans, the Arabic, Arabic speaking tribe of Shabazz who themselves possessed inner divinity. It maintains that some fucked up island of Dr. Moreau, wizard scientist named Yakub, created the white race by some sort of grafting. Lacking inner divinity, these new whites were intrinsically violent and evil, white devils, and they overthrew and enslaved the black superior race uh, and were prophesied to rule for 6,000 years. So how exactly did Yakub graft a new race? That's never made clear. Because uh, magic. If it don't make sense, it's magic. Uh, and how exactly did the new inferior race take uh, the world over and overthrow a superior race? Well, that's never made clear either because it, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Uh, similar to the overwhelming majority of other religious texts I've read, a lot of this shit is never explained because, you know, at its core, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, someone wrote some weird shit down a long time ago. Someone who wasn't even a good writer. And ever since, people have just been expected to believe what can't be proved and what is frankly uh, logically insulting. The NOI sets itself against the white dominant society calling for black people to be economically self-sufficient and separatist. It formally called for an independent black state in North America. It also, not sure I've covered this aspect before, has some interesting UFO beliefs. So that's fun. Tossing some sci-fi into the old theology, shaking shit up. Uh, makes it more exciting for the kids, you know, out there reading Lovecraft, watching the Twilight Zone. Uh, believers maintain that the most recent incarnation of Allah will soon return aboard a spaceship, the mother plane or the mothership to wipe out the white race and inaugurate a black utopia. And that sucks. Come on, guys. Can you spare my family at least? Not, not all of them, maybe, you know, but my core family and a few, a few cousins and at least one aunt. We're some of the good ones. You know, what a bummer. I've been so excited to maybe see aliens someday for as long as I can remember. How sad if I were to finally watch their spaceship come down and I was like, welcome to Earth, you guys. Oh, so happy to have you. So excited to hear your galactic wisdom that you likely have in store for us. And then some Dwight York looking alien steps off the ship and is like, shut the fuck up, white boy. Somebody kill that cracker. <laughs> I didn't fly across the galaxy to be greeted by this baloney and wet dog smelling motherfucker. I don't know. You know, that'd be a real bummer. I don't know. Maybe the belief isn't so crazy. I mean, if you think about it, almost all the people who have claimed to have been abducted by and tortured by aliens, probed and all that, I mean, they have been white. Maybe that's because black supremacist aliens have been targeting and sodomizing white people for years. Killing time before they wipe us off the earth. Wake up, sheeple! We must fight to save white buttholes from black intergalactic sodomy. <laughs> God, I hope someone's Bluetooth malfunctions. <laughs> and their coworkers hear just that sentence with zero context. We must fight to save white buttholes from black intergalactic sodomy. What are you fucking listening to, Ted? Uh, anyway, NOI adherents meet to worship in buildings known as mosques or temples. Interestingly, they teach, or at least historically have taught, uh, that there's no spiritual realm and that the material universe is all that exists. Uh, I don't think I went over that before. Uh, the NOI does not teach the existence of an afterlife. Former leader Elijah Muhammad, who led the NOI for over 40 years, its, more, its most important theological influencer, wrote that when you are dead, you are, all caps, dead. They reject the existence of any spiritual essence or afterlife, but do believe that some of their leaders who have died here on Earth do continue to live out there on some spaceships. So I guess... Uh, Maybe no afterlife, but some people get, like, get to live a lot longer than, than other people. I don't know. It's really confusing, honestly. Like any religion that's been around for any length of time, its beliefs just keep morphing and evolving and mutating and often, uh, often end up becoming you know, pretty contradictory and nonsensical. Hard to keep the narrative straight when it's not a solid story to begin with and you just keep making up so much more nonsense. Uh, NOI practitioners are expected to live highly disciplined lives, adhering to strict dress codes, specific dietary requirements, patriarchal gender roles, NOI was considered an insignificant if highly media-worthy voodoo sect throughout much of the 1930s and 40s. 
At least that's how it was labeled by the white media. Uh, founder Wallace D. Fard, according to the FBI, other aliases of his include Farad Muhammad, Wallace Dodd, Wallace Ford, Wally D. Ford, Wally Ford, Wallace Farad, and his messenger and early successor, Elijah Muhammad, uh, preach an ever-evolving creed with its own changing myths and doctrines. NOI's real boom in popularity came during the 1950s when the advent of the civil rights movement and the violent reactions it provoked converged to make NOI's depiction of the white devil pertinent to, much, uh, to a much larger segment of black America. The NOI's influence expanded greatly through gaining a couple high-profile members like Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X. Rather than settle for legal rights and integration into white society, the Nation of Islam demanded the cultural, political, and economic power to strengthen black communities so they could determine their own futures, which would be great if it wasn't also super racist. Uh, the movement spoke to many young African Americans in the growing counterculture movement, uh, which does, not kidding now, actually make a lot of sense, right? The Rage Against the Machine vibe is going to have a lot of pull on you if the machine really has been fucking over your family and damn near every other member of your race living in your country for the past few centuries. That message is going to carry some legitimacy, some fucking weight. Appointed to the prestigious leadership of Harlem's Temple No. 7 in New York City, just two years after his 1952 release from prison, Malcolm X in particular became wildly popular and his years as a prominent member of NOI from 1952 all the way to 1964, he left less than a year before being assassinated, saw membership skyrocket. And despite his growing popularity, the nation's violent language and its advocacy of self-defense in place of nonviolence did alienate it as well though from most mainstream civil rights groups. By 1959, Martin Luther King was warning of a hate group rising in our midst that would preach the doctrine of black supremacy, obviously talking about the NOI. And the NOI is still around today. Not sure how many adherents there are. The most recent estimate I could find comes from 2007 when there was an estimated 50,000 members in the U.S. Uh, today, the group owns farmland in Michigan and Georgia. Goods produced on the farm are sold online and were recently sold at Your Supermarket, a grocery store in Atlanta that catered to NOI members before closing in 2019. There are two other businesses called Your Supermarket elsewhere in Georgia. Can't determine 100% if they're connected to the NOI or not. Today, the group claims to own thousands of acres of land and is linked to a number of restaurants. Farrakhan's personal net worth, as of 2017, listed as over seven, oh, listed as over three, excuse me, million. Now back to Dwight York. How would this group influence him? Well, York would appropriate aspects of the Nation of Islam, making his own twists, like having sex with whomever he wanted, and relying on public tensions between white authorities and other Islamic groups in New York City to give him a free pass to do what he wanted. The 1970s saw a lot of tension sometimes violence between black nationalistic groups in uh, New York like the NOI. Uh, and York would benefit greatly from this strife and division. The FBI was active in sowing discord between the Nation of Islam, the Black Panther Party, encouraging several incidents in which Black Panthers attacked NOI newspaper sellers. The NOI also engaged in recurring conflicts with other Islamic groups that had predominantly black memberships. It argued with Hamas, Abdul, uh, Khalis, Hanafi's Muslim group. And in 1973, a group of Nation members actually killed seven Hanafi Muslims, five of them children. The nation's leadership would deny sanctioning this attack. Uh, in contrast, York's AAC group seemed relatively benign. Also, conflicts between Muslim extremist groups and police would lead to law enforcement establishing more protection for Muslim communities and people like York who claimed to be Muslim. The wolf in sheep's clothing was in the right place at the right time for his little cult to grow. Uh, the following incident would help York a lot. In April of 1972, a New York City patrol officer named Philip Cardillo responded to a 911 call made from a black Muslim mosque in Harlem. The caller identified himself as a police officer, given a name and precinct number, said he was in trouble. The call was a hoax, but Cardillo didn't know that before he was, uh, you know, uh, he, before he raced into the mosque and was gunned down. In public, the backlash played out much differently than uh, one might expect, and it would allow people like Dwight York to get away with bullshit for a lot longer than they should have. Civilians, many of them black Muslims, said that the main issue was the police uh, officer's violation of the sanctity of the mosque. There were protest rallies around the city. Even though the, the cop got killed here, officials of the Nation of Islam demanded an apology for the police's actions. There were also demands that the NYPD uh, pull out all of its white officers from Harlem. This fucking insanity. Uh, Louis X. Dupree was arrested for killing Philip Cardillo and then acquitted. Calls for a police apology then grew even louder. How dare that officer get shot you know, and, and killed trying to help uh, what he thought was a fellow officer in need? Uh, police chief Patrick Murphy actually issued an apology. Uh, publicly for police intrusion into the mosque. The police department then instituted a set of policies spelling out that extra care would be taken in dealing with black Muslims going forward. The new policies ordered that no patrol officer enter a mosque unless a commanding officer was present. Also, commanders were ordered to coordinate personnel with those in charge of the mosques in order to establish guidelines for police behavior inside the mosques. 
17 Muslim mosques and offices around New York were designated as, quote, sensitive sites where the new policies had to be observed. Besides the mosque, the sensitive sites included offices of groups like the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, and the Black Liberation Army. In 1979, York's group would be added to this list. How lucky for that son of a bitch. York would basically get protection to do whatever he wanted because he was the leader of a supposedly Muslim group. And he took advantage of those calling for police reform and actual victims of racism to get away with committing all sorts of evil acts against his fellow black citizens. His outward face of spirituality and non-militancy, as opposed to other black Muslim groups, even led local police to liking him. They never suspected the heinous abuse he was pulling off privately in the cult. In addition to pulling the NOI beliefs and taking advantage of a lot of fighting between black supremacist groups in the 70s, Dwight York also pulled some of his Nuwabian theology from some New Age beliefs, plus a bit of Freemasonry, and he added some conspiracy theories in there for good measure. He did whatever he thought would keep his followers on the hook and whatever would allow him to operate as a uh, more and more brazen sexual predator. Now, before jumping into the timeline of his life and formation of the life of his cult, where we'll explore so much more of this in a bit more depth, let me give a brief overview of his group's very strange philosophies. The Nuwabians... Some are actually still around despite York's imprisonment, and they still believe this shit. I uh, refer to their belief system, which mixes uh, black supremacist ideas with worship of the Egyptians and the pyramids and a belief in UFOs and various conspiracies and some old, uh, you know, Abrahamic religious teachings and maybe a little bit of Eastern philosophy uh, and some shit related to the Illuminati and the Bilderbergers as a uh, new Wabianism. And they state that it's not a theology. It's a quote, factology. Oh, fucking shoot me. Uh, what an obnoxious made-up adjective. They also call their belief system right knowledge and a slew of other arrogant, stupid, descriptive terms. Uh, luckily, the cult seems like it's on its last legs. There are just a handful of members in Hartford and Atlanta, a few odd bookshops around that still sell some of York's bullshit like All Eyes on Egypt. Or, uh, it's, a, it's a Bushwick uh, bookstore reportedly ran by Nawabians. Check out a five-star Google review from March of 2021. A fascinating store filled with very interesting literature. I don't subscribe to the things written in their material, but I certainly had an insightful and thought-provoking conversation. That's how they get you! With some of the people who worked there. Everyone was kind and welcomed questions and curiosity. I even bought a few things to explore my own. Oh, boy. The Nawabians certainly have a distinct worldview that is very different from my own, but it is a very intriguing place. The temple is absolutely beautiful, very lovely to see blackness portrayed in a way I've never really seen before. Oh, boy. So at least a couple of people still at it. Still saying they're crazy, kind of Islamic, but not really ancient aliens, black supremacy, weird bullshit. Uh, the teachings of the Nawabians are built around the development of a new, i.e. weird and totally made up a nonsensical understanding of African-American people. A project not unlike that undertaken by the Moorish Science Temple and the Nation of Islam previously. Uh, York saw those groups, you know, whip up some self-serving ideology and figured he could do about the same and he did. York drew a bit upon the Christian Bible. He drew a lot from the Holy Quran for an initial affirmation as, uh, of Allah as alone in his power, the all, the oneness, uh, Jesus seen as the Messiah. York taught that Muhammad, the last of the prophets and the lineage of Adam, passed his lineage to his daughter uh, uh, Fatima and son-in-law Ali. Adam and Eve, uh, a.k.a. Hawa, were Nubian, a.k.a. black people. Problems quickly developed for Adam's descendants in Noah's time. I bet they did, you know. When you only have one dude, and one lady to procreate an entire race of people, ha, well, you're going to have some incest issues. Uh, one of Noah's sons, Ham, des uh, desired to commit sodomy after having come upon his father in an unclothed condition. This is, uh, <laughs> this is some of uh, York teachings here. This comes from Genesis 5.32, a verse usually interpreted as Ham seeing his dad naked when his dad's drunk on wine. And he doesn't, uh, you know, know his son sees him until he sobers up. And York really ups the ante here. And he jumps uh, from the sin of a bit of peeping to some butt fucking, which Noah somehow doesn't know about until he sobers up. It's a, it's a weird big leap to make. York does a lot of a lot of this, a lot of big weird leaps. And also, what's going on with Noah's butthole here? I mean, clearly, if York's version is correct, Ham was not Noah's first anal rodeo. I mean, how constantly stretched and gaped is your butthole uh, if someone's able to sneak up on you and just fucking ram it in? <laughs> and you don't notice until you sober up the next day. I don't think Ham popped that particular backdoor cherry here. Uh, for his sin of buggering his father, Noah's fourth son, Canaan, or Canaan was uh, stricken with leprosy, thus acquiring a pale skin, and now all the light-skinned races are descendants of Canaan. That's literally not how leprosy works, whatever. And then an additional important step in the human race hierarchy develops uh, with uh, Noah's descendant, Abraham. Uh, Abraham's son, Isaac, and grandson, Jacob, come from the Isra Israelites. They were enslaved for 420 years in Egypt. From his son, Ishmael, came the Ishmaelites, or the Nubians. And if you're a biblical scholar and some of this doesn't quite read correctly, it's because that's, uh, you know, York is just twisting 
shit. He's uh, reinterpreting a lot here. Uh, the Nubians now include the black people of the U.S., the West Indies, and other parts of the globe. York asserted that it was predicted that they would be in slavery for about 400 years at some point. And because of their descent from Abraham, uh, they are rightfully also called Hebrews, just as modern Jews. Echoes of fellow uh, black supremacist cult leader Yahweh Ben Yahweh's theology here. All of this would be expounded upon in Dwight York's many, many books. So many books. More of a pamphlet writer than a book writer, uh, but his pamphlets are often call called books. You can't, you can't find digital copies, at least I couldn't, on Amazon or Goodreads or any of the other large traditional online bookstores. It's even hard to find paperback or hard, you know, back uh, copies uh, or hardcover copies. But I did find literally 20 different York titles on a site called scribd.com. Never used it before. It's a subscription site. But if you're willing to pay $9.99, you can get so much Nuwabian crazy in the form of so many PDFs. You can read titles like Science of Healing where York asserts that of course he can heal you because there is literally nothing he doesn't know. Writing, for over 25 years to date, day in and day out, I have successfully and profoundly answered all questions put to me. I am not merely a religious teacher. I am also a guide, a friend, a father, a doctor. Uh, he's not a doctor, by the way. Numerous sources have gone out of their way to point out that he just adopted that title and he has no formal doctorate education uh, whatsoever. He says, a big brother and a teacher. I am your caliphate. Uh, Caliphat, uh, accept it or not, for there is none more qualified to make straight your way to the creator. Dude was not shy when it came to making grandiose claims. He doesn't just have answers to literally every question you've put before him for 25 fucking years, you ingrate. He has profound answers. Hello? Come on. Fuck your regular old answers. Go profound or go home. Uh, there's also the Egyptian way to overcome bad habits. My personal favorite. This is a book pamphlet classic jam-packed with so much deep, hard to attain in your own wisdom power nuggets. Like very often, if you repeat something several times in the same way, you will have formed the habit. Doing it that way or this way always leads to doing things my way, me first. It becomes what is known as habitual. And if it's disturbing to others, you are called obnoxious. This repeated action wins you the title of pain in the butt. Fucking genius, Dwight. God, you go deep. <laughs> really solid insights here. I can see why a large cult formed around you. I've always wondered how to avoid becoming a pain in the butt. Now I get it. Thank you for the wisdom. Uh, there's also the all-time classic, probably taught in Ivy League theology courses right now, uh, 666 Leviathan, the best of the Antichrist. Uh, <laughs> the beast, <laughs> not the best. The best, that'd be great. The Antichrist is greatest hits. Uh, the beast of the Antichrist, part one of four. Oh, so, so, so good that they had to have three sequels written. Uh, the beast on the cover has seven heads, and guess what? All white people. Uh, I really like how the 666 book opens. It has been customary in the past for me to include an introduction in the beginning of all pamphlets and scrolls. This revised edition of Leviathan the Beast as the Antichrist contains so, contains so profound that I, Dr. Malachi Z, York 33 degree slash 720 degree, as well as you will agree again that this book needs no introduction. He goes all caps at the end. He doesn't have time for intros, right? He's got a jam-packed molestation schedule to attend to. Uh, I like how he added some numbers to his title here. You know, pulling from the Freemasons a bit. It's not just Dr. Malachi Z. York. Come on. He's elevated. Continual improvement. That's one of the qualities I admire most, most about Dr. York. He quickly goes on to say, I must take a moment to mention that I have taught you of the existence of beings called extraterrestrials or extra beings on your planet called Terra, now called Earth. Many times before, these beings that come from their home, the eighth planet Rizik in the, of the 19th galaxy, Ilwin, chose me to be born at exactly the right time. That is why my mother and relatives cited the presence of the great starship on that Tuesday at 12 o'clock midnight on June 26, 1945 AD. Reading down a little further, uh, it doesn't get any less crazy, as I'm guessing you might imagine. I love how quickly he dives into uh, Alien Jibber Jabber in a book with a strong Abrahamic religion title. Uh, also like how he says, I must take a moment to mention that, that I've taught you. Feels like he's throwing around some attitude there. In case you forgot, might I remind you that we went over a lot of this shit already. Getting a little tired of repeating myself, okay? The beans from Rizik chose me to tell you what the fuck is going on as I have brought up before. Uh, that's why I wear the pharaoh hat. That's me. And that's why you dress up like extras in a Western movie. Any questions? Good, moving on. And he really did have followers dress up like cowboys for a while in Georgia. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, back to the pseudo-Islamic, uh, but not really uh, kind of biblical basis, but not also really race hierarchy and black supremacy beliefs now. Uh, in many of the pamphlet books, he brings up uh, all sorts of crazy evidence to support his race claims, like these uh, pseudo word meanings. He does this constantly. 
He does this weird thing in all of his books where he throws a parenthetical after a regular word, breaking it apart and revealing its true meaning like he's some brilliant linguistic detective exposing deeply hidden secrets, right? Giving you that sweet, sweet secret knowledge. Like the word believe, all right? You see it as just the word believe because you're fucking dumb, okay? He's smart and he breaks it out into be, lie, Eve. To lie to Eve's children. Don't believe the white man. It's all lies. He might have had to add an extra E in there to make it the work, you know, but the breakout work, but whatever. Uh, Caucasian, he twists and breaks out to carcass Asian. Hello, denigrated Asian. Jesus is a combination of the words Ja, Rastafarian name for God, and Zeus. Jesus is black Zeus. It's right there in the word. Wake up! <laughs> Why haven't you heard that before? Well, because white devils are hiding the truth from you. Semantic enslavement. And if that doesn't make sense to you, it's because you're white and you're fucking stupid. Tough break, cracker. We get into more so much here, and we will. Uh, the, bulk of, the bulk of the insanity lies in today's time suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. June 26, 1945. Starting with Dwight York's birthday. Probably. As we'll soon learn, almost everything about his childhood can be called into question. Uh, dude lied so much. According to a birth certificate issued in the U.S., Dwight D. York, born in Boston, Massachusetts, on that date. Other sources likely fed lies by Dwight. List his birthplace as New Jersey, New York, Baltimore, even uh, uh, Takarati, Ghana. Sorry if I'm uh, pronouncing Takarati uh, incorrectly. There are more origin stories. Dwight loved to make up new identities and stories about himself to suit whatever new narrative he's pushing. One area where he did a lot of storytelling was regarding his ancestry. He gave a variety of stories about his uh, ancestry and birth, including his fave that he was born in Sudan, which has not been documented. Officially, according to government documents, his parents uh, are Mary C. York, formerly Mary C. Williams, also known as uh, Fatima Maryam, excuse me, and her husband, David Piper York. But of course, York has a different story. On his mother's side, York described his maternal grandfather, Clarence Daniel Bobby Williams, as an Egyptian Moor named Salah uh, Halak Al-Gala, a merchant seaman from a little village called Balula in Nubia of ancient Egypt. Uh, nope. I'm going to go with a hard nope here. Guessing 23andMe and Ancestry.com would have some problems uh, with all of this information. Uh, another genealogical tree he would write about, likely of York's invention, uh, shows Bobby Williams' father as unknown and his mother as Madame de Conte of the Bassa tribe of Liberia. Once again, no actual documentation outside of York's claims to support this. Also, according only to York, his mom was 19 when she went to Egypt from the U.S. and she began a relationship with a man named Al-Hadi Abdur Rahman Al-Mahdi, a prince of the royal family of Sudan, again, who has too many names. Uh, of course a prince, always a prince, never a part-time dock worker these backstories, right? Never like a waste treatment assistant technician or a door-to-door yo-yo salesman or some shit. Always, always a noble birth. Uh, York's mom didn't know about her boyfriend's royal lineage. And when she found out and was called back home, she was pregnant. And that's why he wasn't raised in some kind of Aladdin Disney castle. When she was in her ninth month, she went back to Sudan to meet the family. What wasn't received well, the royal family's like, nah, get out of here, beat it. And then her son was born on August 12th, 1944. I know the date has changed. And despite being rejected, she gave him the royal name Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. The date and the name, important parts of the story. The, the story that York would weave about himself. He claimed his birth was exactly 100 years after the birth of the man he claimed was his great-grandfather, the Mahdi. Sometimes listed in June, sometimes listed in August. It's very confusing. Uh, he got real into this dude. In Sudanese history, the Mahdi, a.k.a. Muhammad Ahmad bin Ab Abid Allah, was a revered warrior and spiritual leader who formed a successful rebellion against the British. Many Muslims believe that he was uh, the reformer, the renewer of the faith, and that uh, that kind of person only comes along once a century. And Dwight preached that he was the next reformer, right? And there's more to this guy and Dwight's forced connections to him that we'll explore when it comes up again later in the timeline. And again, of course, no documentation to support any of this. Another place he loved to make up stories was his name. York claims that he was not given the name York uh, you know, until about a month after his birth, when he and his mother returned to Boston. In Boston, she used the name, the name Dwight York because her family didn't want to recognize his true Arabic name. <laughs> this claim, uh, never supported by his parents, David and Mary, or their four other children, David, Dale, Deborah, and Dennis. He has some siblings. Cult leaders don't seem to have close relationships with siblings, I've noticed, right? Hard to get the siblings to go along with and properly substantiate their constantly changing fabricated backstory. So they just uh, cut ties with them. Uh, York has claimed... 
Again, without documentation, uh, that his father was descended from Ben York, an enslaved African-American who took part in the Lewis and Clark expedition from 1804 to 1806. I'm going to say no. Dwight would then say he was uh, raised in Massachusetts until the age of seven, then, then went to uh, Aswan, Egypt, learned about Islam. Uh, nope. I probably went to public school in Boston. Uh, at age seven in 1952, if we believe Dwight, uh, which I don't, uh, you know, his uh, biological dad has a change of heart, calls him back to Africa. He would write, my grandfather... Uh, as Saeed Abdur Rahman al-Mahdi, the imam of the Ansars in, the, in Sudan until 1959 AD, uh, upon looking into my eyes, foretold that I was the one who would possess the light. So it's confirmation that Dwight was the foretold reformer. So either that happened, or maybe around that time, he was just going to school in Boston and had teachers saying things to him like, Dwight, pay attention. If you keep this up, you're gonna have to repeat the third grade again. So, you know, one of those things probably happened. Uh, York would write that he spent five years in Africa raised by a man named uh, Shaki Haswan, uh, an uncle on his father's side. Dwight claims he returned to the U.S. at age 12 in 1957, where he continued to study Islam under the tutelage of uh, Shaki Dawad, who was then the leader of the State Street Mosque in Brooklyn. And then as an adolescent, he moved with his family to Teaneck, New Jersey. This part about living in Teaneck seems to be true. Not a lot of info about what he did in Teaneck, but we learned some interesting things about Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, Teaneck in the 1960s was a hotspot for the civil rights movement and organized efforts to desegregate schools and other public institutions. Activist Theodora Smiley Lacey and her husband Archie left Louisiana for Teaneck in 1961. Some neighbors moved out after they moved in and some locals strongly resisted the idea of black and white because uh, some of the locals strongly resisted the idea of black and white children learning side by side in local public schools. Theodore and Archie were not discouraged by what they encountered in Teaneck, and they decided to push for change. The Lacey's were part of a group that fought discriminatory housing practices, banded together with like-minded Teaneck residents and educators to desegregate the township schools. They succeeded, with the school district becoming the first in the nation to integrate with a court order in 1964. No doubt Dwight was influenced by all this. I imagine the future cult leader saw the ways that people could band together around a good cause, desegregation. He later co opted this rallying around a common cause ethos for his own shitty ends. York wrote that on the weekends while living in Teaneck, he'd visit Brooklyn, only 22 miles away, about a 45-minute bus ride, where he came under the influence of a man called Brother Love, an Islamic man who lived in the same public housing project where his mother lived with York's stepbrother and stepsisters. No info regarding why he lived away from his mom. Uh, but I'm going to uh, say there's an 80% chance this part is true or mostly true. He would never mention graduated from high school, but would claim to have studied at universities in Egypt and Sudan. Going to go with 100% true on the not graduating from high school. <laughs> after reading many of his pamphlet books, going to go with 100% not true regarding studying in Egypt or Sudan. And this true or not true game is not going to go on forever, by the way. The older he gets, the more documentation there is on this slippery son of a bitch. Uh, on June 25th, 1964, 100% true, Dwight York gets arrested for, no surprise here, statutory rape for having sex with a 13-year-old girl when he's 21. Fucking creep. Uh, only given a suspended sentence, put on probation. And of course, as he gets older, he doesn't stop fucking, you know, children. Uh, he just gets better at not getting caught. For a long time. Uh, he does get caught for some other crimes just a few months later. On October 24th, 1964, York gets arrested for assault, possession of a deadly weapon, and resisting arrest. And his probation for the statutory rape is revoked, and he spends the next three years in prison at Elmira Reception Center. York is back on the scene in 1967. After being released from prison, he works for a time as a street peddler in Harlem, selling some pamphlet books he'd written. Always the crazy pamphlet books with this guy. And some other items, including incense. Heavy on the incense as well. Uh, 1967, York would also marry an American woman, Dorothy Johnson, who then takes the Arabic name Zubadia. And uh, around this time, York starts picking up a handful of followers with his uh, black supremacist pseudo-Islamic talk, many of whom would then live in his and his wife's apartment. He starts calling himself Imam Isa, like the title of a Muslim prayer leader, but with an extra A. Dude cannot spell for shit. Sometimes it's hard to even understand what he's talking about in his books because the spelling's so off. He wasn't big on hiring an editor. A lot of his titles and religious figures that he writes about are consistently spelled so incorrectly, I'm not sure exactly who the fuck he's talking about. Maybe it was intentional, because he also spent a lot of time in all, all the pamphlet books I've read comparing what you've been told is true to what I know is the real truth. So there could be a theme of the misspelled version being the, rid the real, hidden, actually correct spelled version. Uh, his pamphlets combined elements of the Moorish Science Temple of uh, America, the Nation of Islam, the Nation of Gods and Earths, and Freemasonry. He calls his first group Ansar Pure Sufi. Uh, they styled themselves as a Sufi Muslim group, wore a uniform, uniform of black tunics. All this is going down in Bushwick now. And uh, let's let's uh, visit, revisit Bushwick a bit. Let's talk about Dwight York and how he was able to amass such a following, right? we gotta got to get some context on the kind of people uh, that found him such an inspiration. 
1970, York started street preaching on the streets of Bushwick and Brooklyn. And street preaching, uh, not uncommon at this place, at this time, Bushwick is a working class neighborhood in the northern part of the New York City borough of Brooklyn, bounded by the neighborhood of Ridgewood, Queens to the northeast, Williamsburg to the northwest, right? Hipster Central, uh, East New York and the cemeteries of Highland Park to the southeast, Brownsville to the south, and bed to the southwest. Quick area history in 1638, the Dutch West India Company secured a deed from the local uh, Lenape people for the Bushwick area and Peter Stuyvesant, or I, I think that's how you say his name, uh, it's Peter, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with Stuyvesant, uh, charted the area in 1661, naming it Boswick, meaning neighborhood in the woods in 17th century Dutch. The English would take over many towns surrounding Manhattan, including Bushwick, and unite them under Kings County in 1683. The town of Bushwick, which along with, uh, um, oh boy, uh, Brookhaven and Bedford, uh, they looked good, uh, written down, harder to say than I thought, uh, became incorporated as the city of Brooklyn on January 1st, 1854, and, and they included present-day Williamsburg and Greenpoint. When Bushwick was founded, it was primarily an area for farming food and tobacco. As Brooklyn and New York City grew, factories that manufactured sugar, oil, and chemicals were built on the farmland. Inventor Peter Cooper, guy who designed and built uh, the first American steam locomotive, built a glue manufacturing plant, his first factory in Bushwick. Immigrants from Western Europe soon joined the original Dutch settlers. Many of these immigrants were German and brought with them knowledge of brewing and bottling beer, making Bushwick a hub for breweries. Uh, it included Brewers Row, 14 breweries, operating in a 14-block area in 1890. The Bushwick Glass Company, later known as Brookfield Glass Company, established itself in 1869 when a local brewer sold it to James Brookfield. Made a variety of bottles and jars, as well as uh, large numbers of glass electrical insulators for telegraph, telephone, and power lines around the country. So it was, it was hopping. It was an industrial hotspot. Uh, recently, Bushwick has been flooded with young professionals, many of them white from Manhattan. In the wake of reduced crime rates citywide in recent years and a shortage of affordable housing in nearby neighborhoods like Park Slope and Williamsburg, these young people moved into converted warehouse lofts, brownstones, limestone brick townhouses, other renovated buildings in Bushwick, making communities of coffee shops, parks, art galleries, and studios, and more. But in Dwight York's day, Bushwick was not so uh, gentrified is the term, I think. The demographic transition of Bushwick after World War II was similar to that of many Brooklyn neighborhoods. The U.S. Census records show that the neighborhood's population was almost 90% white in 1960, dropped to less than 40% white by 1970. During this transition, white-collar workers were being replaced by those migrating from the South. Later numbers of Puerto Ricans, African Americans moved into homes in the southeastern edge of the neighborhood, closest to Eastern Parkway. By the mid-1950s, migrants began settling in large numbers in central Bushwick. There was also a change in the area's economy. Bushwick had long been a spot for breweries, but rising energy costs, advances in transportation, the change to the use of aluminum cans from bottles encouraged many of the beer companies to move on out. Another contribution to the change in the socioeconomic profile of the neighborhood was the John Lindsay administration's policy of raising available rent for welfare recipients. Lindsay was the mayor of New York City from 1966 to 1973. Since these tenants could now bring higher rents than tenants would on the open market, landlords began filling vacant units with such tenants. By the mid-1970s, roughly half of Bushwick's residents were on public assistance. According to the New York Times, Bushwick was still a neatly maintained community of wood houses in the mid-1960s. Then within five years, it had become, quote, what often approached to a no-man's land of abandoned buildings, empty lots, drugs, and arson. Quite a picture. Just a drug-riddled hellhole that's on fucking fire. How much did that suck if you were a lifelong Bushwick resident? You grew up in a neighborhood of working class people who cared about their lawns, who washed their cars in the driveway, you know, put in 40 hour work weeks. And you're able to buy a home in that same neighborhood as a young adult. Like your parents, you care about your neighborhood, you care about your neighbors, you're trying to keep the streets clean, safe for the kids. And then in just five years, a lot of your neighbors have moved out, new neighbors have moved in, they brought a bunch of crime with them. Now suddenly you don't want to let your kids play out front, you don't want them walking to school, your property value plummets, you no longer recognize the working class neighborhood you grew up in. My childhood neighborhood is a fucking dump right now, and it sucks. When I was a kid in the 80s in Riggins, Idaho, living in the block called North Riggins, there was primarily an older crowd who cared about, you know, uh, keeping their shit nice, mowing their lawns, putting on fresh coats of paint in their houses, and planting flowers in their gardens, all that stuff. It was the final years of locals having made sawmill money before the sawmill burned down, you know, it was the final years of the town being a blue-collar town. People combed their hair, they brushed their teeth, they took care of their property, they didn't do a shitload of meth, and then a lot of those people died or moved away. And, uh, you know, the new people, uh, people who didn't move away, people who moved in, a crowd of people I call river rats, uh, a lot of them are just lazy fucking dirtbags. I don't know uh, how else to describe it. They just got junk all over their lawns because they just don't give a shit. Peel and paint on their houses, overgrown dead grass. Nothing looks clean. They don't look clean. It's like 100% of the pride of the give a fuck. It just got sucked out of my old neighborhood. 
and it's pretty depressing. Glad I don't live there. Uh, my grandparents built rentals in that neighborhood, had nice little houses there, and then they sold all those rentals because they got sick of one dirtbag tenant after another destroying the houses they built while also not paying rent. Environment matters. It affects you, right? And Bushwick's environment took a nosedive in the let's try to keep shit nice, guys, come on, department. The local environment went from one of hope and progress to hopelessness and despair. By the 1980s, the area's Knickerbocker Avenue shopping district was nicknamed The Well for its seemingly unending supply of hard drugs. Even through the 1990s, it remained a poor and relatively dangerous area with 77 murders, 80 rapes, uh, almost 2,300 robberies in 1990 alone. And that, and that, of course, is just the reported crimes. And this would be the place where Dwight York would get his start, way back in 1970. A place riddled with drugs, crime, where hope of anything getting better on a social level felt very far away. Hopelessness and desperation go hand in hand. And if you know anything about cults, they feed on desperation. Much easier to swindle the desperate than the satisfied. 1968, now 27-year-old con artist Dwight York changes the name of his group to the Nubian Islamic Hebrews. And they exchange their tunics for African robes kicking up the pageantry a notch, evolving into whatever York thinks he can sell easier. And then from 1970 to 1973, York makes uh, several trips to Africa, to Sudan, to Egypt in particular. Uh, this actually is true. You know, got to build up some black supremacy legitimacy if you want to take your cult to the next level. You can't preach a bunch of uh, Africans are better than everyone else rhetoric and not have spent any time in Africa. 1973, while traveling in uh, Sudan, York meets and marries another woman, uh, Fatima. They have two children together. What about his first wife, Dorothy, uh, who he'd married in 1967? Well, I can only assume they're still married and that his marriage with uh, Fatima is not legally recognized in the U.S. Cannot find a marriage record for her or a divorce record for Zubadia, uh, a.k.a. Dorothy. Dwight would later definitely preach a belief in polygamy, so it would not be out of character for him at all to take a second wife here and keep the first one, which I'm guessing he definitely did. Lucky, lucky ladies, married to a narcissistic polygamous convicted pedophile with a god complex and delusions of grandeur. What a catch. Uh, on these trips, York met and persuaded descendants of Muhammad Ahmed al-Mahdi's family, that Sudanese 19th century revolutionary, to finance him to set up a cell of their Uma Party organization in the U.S. This is interesting. Uh, ties back to historical that historical figure we met earlier. Uh, the Uma Party is an African Islamic political party. Their leader has been prime minister of Sudan from 1966-1967 uh, uh, when he was dethroned in a political coup. York was given an untold amount of funding to set up a West or American political wing of Sudan's Ansar movement under Sadiq al-Mahdi, head of that Uma party. Now, once back in the States, York really pushed his claim of Sudanese roots in order to authenticate his American branch of the sect. Now, how much money was he given? I don't think the amount matters. Sadiq al-Mahdi uh, was giving him something far more valuable than, uh, than cash for a cult leader. He was giving him black power legitimacy. Also, I should mention that Sadiq al-Mahdi was fucking insane. I'm sure that's why he and Dwight got along. Uh, Sadiq actually just died from COVID complications at the age of 84 this past November. And the Ansar movement he was the leader of was a Sufi religious mo uh, movement in Sudan, uh, Sufi being a type of Islamic mysticism whose followers were disciples of Muhammad Ahmad uh, bin uh, uh, Abid <laughs> Allah, Jesus Christ, uh, that revolutionary York tied himself to with the remaining or reimagining of his birthplace and date. And a lot of these people, their names change. <laughs> so if, uh, I get a little dizzy. Like he, York is not the only one to change his name all the time. Uh, and that revolutionary claimed to be the Mahdi and the Mahdi Arabic for the rightly guided one is a Messiah figure who, according to some Muslim beliefs, primarily Sunni and Shia will appear at the end times to rid the world of evil and injustice. Much more than just the reformer. I mentioned him to be earlier. According to doctrine, he'll show up just before Jesus Asa in Islam, not the son of God, but an important prophet. And the two of them will tag team the antichrist in an apocalyptic battle. And then the Mahdi will rule the world for seven years and then Jesus will rule for 40 years. Then, well, I don't fucking know because <laughs> this shit's crazy. And interpretations of this craziness keep twisting and morphing. Uh, so many groups have put their own spin on it, uh, you know, and this is why people have religious wars, right? They just can't agree on which version of their what the fuck are people talking about is correct. Uh, did I mention Sadiq al-Mahdi also hates the whites? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Ummah party was built on Islam and also get the fuck out of here, you oppressive white British bastards. Take all the whites with you. Uh, in the early 1970s, back from Africa, York's group changed his name to the Ansaru Allah community. Ansaru sounds a lot like Ansar, doesn't it? Right? He's just doing one of his slight little tweaks, binding himself to the Uma Party's Ansar movement, trying to give himself some legitimacy. Dwight's AAC purported to follow Orthodox Islam. They changed their garb now to traditional Islamic dress. The AAC is a messianic, millennialist, purportedly Muslim group that quickly becomes well-known amongst other New York City black nationalist and black Muslim groups at the time. They were, also, uh, they were also quite different from many of the other black nationalist groups. Uh, for one thing, they were not militant, at least not on the surface. 
the AAC did not engage in the hostile sectarian and political rhetoric used by some groups of Islamic Arabs. York found a good niche for people who wanted a separatist community but didn't want the militancy. Militancy, right? York's son remembered him saying, I got this new thing, black power mixed with clean living. All the racism, none of the violence. Uh, York's success in growing his own group came from his natural gift of salesmanship, which he used to sell his own quasi-religious tracts on the streets of black neighborhoods from Brooklyn to Harlem. We've covered numerous cult leaders who started off as street preachers, right? Handing out pamphlets. Tony and Susan Alamo did a fair amount of street preaching. David Berg, super creepy. Pedo fuck from the Children of God cult. He did a good chunk of street preaching. He liked a pamphlet. Uh, makes me think of those weirdos wearing billboards and carrying bullhorns in Times Square or Venice Beach or, you know, many downtowns across the world, I'm guessing, definitely across the country. You know, Westboro Baptist church types out there yelling, repent now, the Antichrist is here. Hellfire awaits those who do not submit to the power and mercy of the Lord. And I always think when I see those people like, what a fucking lunatic. You know, what a good way to waste your life. And I bet most other people think that too, but not everyone. And those who don't think that, oh, they're the street preachers, bread and butter. Those street pre preachers, at least the ambitious ones, they know how to play the numbers game, right? You yell at a thousand people, you're probably going to get 99 or uh, excuse, excuse me, 999 hard no's. But that doesn't matter because you're also maybe going to get one yes. Might be one yes in 2000 or maybe 5,000, but a yes is still a yes, right? And that's great. These, these, these people have grit, tenacity, perseverance, they understand it's not about uh, all the thousands who say no. It's about that handful who say yes. You can build on that handful. Sometimes that handful can be built into hundreds or thousands of disciples if you stay at it long enough. For years, York, York would only have a handful of followers, but those followers became very dedicated and they would help him gain oh, so many other followers later. His community was small enough for most of the male followers to sleep on the floor of York and his wife's who bought his apartment for a while. Once he settled in Bushwick, started going by the AEC name, forging relationships with local authorities, who were happy to have a non-confrontational, non-violent Muslim group in their midst, things started to improve for them. The blocks where the AAC lived became an oasis of safety in the crime-ridden neighborhood. People would even purposely park on the AAC streets because they knew they were safe. The police were happy to let the AAC do their own policing because at the time, that section of Bushwick needed all the help it could get. The center of the AAC was in the 400 block of Bushwick Avenue, a few blocks from the intersection of Bushwick and Broadway, where elevated trains rattled over the streets, low-rent shops cluttered the blocks, Throughout the 70s, the AAC flourished, expanding beyond Brooklyn to communities in at least a dozen major American cities. They got bigger than Keith Raniere's recent Nexium cult, another cult we've covered that originated in New York. According to former follower Sadiq Red, New uh, York had between 2,000 and 3,000 followers at the height of the uh, Bushwick era of his cult in the 70s. Their headquarters remained in Bushwick for years. York eventually had 500 people living in about 20 apartment buildings he owned, his most dedicated followers once he obtained the building. He had it painted white and green uh, to match his other buildings. He was building a commune of sorts right there in Brooklyn. The AAC operated bookstores, gift shops, a clothing store, even had a grocery store all next to each other. AAC chapters were being founded, you know, not only in other American cities uh, at the peak, but also in Trinidad, London, and Toronto. It was looking for a moment like they, like they might give Scientology a run for their money. How were they funding all of this? In typical cult fashion, followers paid for almost all of it, starting with money they earned by saying goodbye to their old lives and their old possessions, selling all their shit, giving all the money to York. AAC members in Brooklyn were asked to surrender all their possessions, live in York's barrack-style apartments, then work for free. Many were given a daily income quote of 25 to 100 bucks, which they had to reach by begging or selling literature or incense. And then they were fed cheap food and placed in crowded apartments, right? Good way to expand your business quickly. Your per-employee labor costs tend to be real, real cheap when you're running a cult. The literature AAC men sold, some of that top-shelf theology I read from earlier, uh, didn't just uh, raise money for York and his group, but also promoted the AAC, encouraged readers to become, or uh, encouraged more people to come here uh, York preach. When people came to York's part of Bushwick, many were impressed. They saw a village of Muslim commerce and brothership or brother, you know, br br yeah, whatever. <laughs> they saw, uh, I couldn't pull that word out of my, out of thin air. Muslim commerce and fellowship. There we go. And spirituality. At the Ansar Needles trade shop, people could purchase, purchase the garb of the righteous, including Moroccan robes, fabric, men's tunics, captains, prayer caps, scarves, and more. This shit was all the rage for people in the 70s. Some people felt so raw, underground, and real. Uh, at some things, gift shop and bookstore, people could buy Arabic numeral watches, plants, games, leather goods, and of course, a wide selection of York's fantastic books. So exotic and new and different and exciting. The Turban Jewel Shop offered a selection of pendants, earrings, brooches, bracelets, and nose rings. Your community market stocked groceries like halal pizza, Philly-style Philly hoagies, and Islamic and Hispanic pastries. Outsiders were impressed. York is making some good money. 
1989, Newsday columnist Jimmy Breslin would write a column about the difference between York's blocks and the rest of Bushwick, saying, outside the street was tranquil, the carnations and roses turning the air sweet. The men in white watched. The women walked by with their faces covered. Agree with how they live or not, they run the one sidewalk in the city of New York where there is no such thing as drugs. And while uh, all this is going on, Dwight York, uh, not only leading a cult, also trying to become a rock star. <laughs> Let's talk about his music again. Cult leaders, man, all right, they want to be rock stars so often. This comes up so much. Uh, David Koresh, remember Branch Davidian cult leader? He was uh, really into wanting to become a rock star. Remember, remember his Muzak? Uh-huh. Madman living in Waco. Sure was a madman living in Waco. Like I was a fucking lunatic. And then there was Charles Manson. Remember, uh, remember, look at your game, girl. Come on. There's a time for living. Not bad. The time keeps on flying. If he just wasn't so crazy. Think you're loving, baby, and all you do is trying. Can you feel? Maybe he could have done something. That's a demo. It's rough. There's, there's a little bit of talent there. And then there was uh, Tony uh, Alamo, who uh, before he became a street preacher, tried to make it as a pop star under the name of Marcus Abad. <laughs> this, is, uh, this song is not as good. Song's so creepy. Would you care if I should kiss you <laughs> or hold you tonight? A little Yankee girl, I want to kiss her, I want to take it in my coat, I brainwash you. Uh, that was a terrible song, but then there, uh, but not as bad as Father Yod <laughs> from the Source Cult. I had listened to him for a while. I had listened to uh, Father Yod's Yahawa 13. Uh, still might be the worst band I've ever heard in my entire fucking life. Oh, God. Yikes. I might rather listen to Yoko Ono than listen to Yahawai 13. There's fucking neck and neck with some of the worst music that's ever been produced. Uh, that little bit of ear candy is called Little Doggy. But remember, he, he was really at it for a while, for years. Wanted to be a rock star. Even Marshall Applewhite. I always forget about that from Heaven's Gate. He had a single that actually hit the charts. Do you remember when he sang, I Gotta Try? Not bad. Weird thinking about that coming from Marshall Applewhite, you know? Because, uh, you know, it didn't. Maybe that was Michael Motherfucking McDonald. Uh, you know, singing. You, you get the idea. Hail Triple M. Everyone wants to be a fucking rock star, including cool leaders. During the 1970s, York was, as I mentioned earlier, in a disco R&B band called Passion. He was the lead singer. Before he, you know, spread out and went on his solo career. Uh, he, he tried to downplay the sexual nature of the band's name, Passion. Saying it was just supposed to mean the, the passion of the Christ. Passion suffered by Jesus. Even though he was kind of Islamic. He'd sometimes, you know, go over to Jesus. I wish you could see the album cover from the record. It is so fucking sexual. <laughs> like the most. Close-up photo of like the greased up side of a woman's hips and ass. Dude's hand on one cheek. Other hand reached up to grab where her hair would be. As if he was, I don't know, you know, hitting it from behind. But it's about Jesus. It's about the crucifixion. Uh-huh. Uh, why is he talking about Jesus so much when he claims to be Islamic? Just blend in whatever he wants, whatever he thinks is going to work. Uh, he would actually claim that the entire band of passion was a religious endeavor. He, just, he wanted to get the attention of young people and expose them to Islam and convert them to the AAC. <laughs> what a bunch of bullshit. Uh, here's a snippet from their, you know, very Christian, Islamic, whatever, single, 1982's Don't Stop My Love. Now, is this about Islamic conversion or is it about just, you know, wanting to get your fuck on? Talk about Jesus. Holding Jesus. 
Better hold on tight, Jesus, because I'm going to try to fuck you so hard. Uh, wait, what? Uh, I mean, no, it's just JK. Ha ha. I'm not going to try and fuck Jesus. Um, York would save his music. I would not. I do not enjoy dressing up in Western style clothes and being in the company of alcohol, cigarettes, and ugh, fornication. Ugh. But as a doctor, I must go where the sick are. He hated all this. He hated sex. He's just trying to help people. He's a doctor who never went to school. Um, Dr. York, sometimes he was Dr. Love. Uh, Passion, this band would perform at many schools and civic functions, which is disturbing considering who he was. He would get letters of recommendation from people like Wilson Good, mayor of Philadelphia, from New York City public school system, which is, again, super disturbing. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, he started off with the music taking the doctor title, and he just kind of hung on to it because, you know, his, he found out his followers liked thinking of him as a, as a doctor. He was so committed to making it as a big R&B singer, uh, he even built a professional recording studio in Bushwick. In one of his uh, texts, he claimed that many musical stars had passed through his studio where he tried to save them from the devil. People like Stevie Wonder, <laughs> Cool in the Gang, OJs, Nancy Wilson, The Supremes, Bob Marley. He also claims he's inf he influenced uh, heavily, you know, Queen Latifah, Public Enemy, LL Cool J. <laughs> I'm guessing they would feel differently if interviewed. Uh, if they could even remember who the fuck this lunatic was. His name does not appear in the liner notes for any of their, for any of their albums, as far as uh, we can tell. I don't, I don't remember Queen Latifah thanking Dr. York in her 1995 Grammy acceptance speech for best rap solo performance. Uh, did York really make enough money off of his businesses and the slave labor of his followers to not only run a cult and buy up a bunch of businesses, but also fund his dreams of musical fame? Uh, not exactly. It would come out, you know, after he was arrested, that the remarkable growth of the AAC didn't come entirely from the money uh, brought in by street peddlers. He wasn't selling quite that many books. Uh, 1993 report from a domestic terrorism unit of the FBI found that some, and this would not be reported until well after 1993, uh, reported that some of the real estate expansion had been fueled by fires, fires that some of Dwight York's followers may have set. The report cited eight instances of arson, uh, the general pattern being that when York wished to acquire a new property and the owner was reluctant to sell to him for a lowball offer he would make, uh, then, so weird, uh, their building would catch on fire. And then Dwight would buy it at an auction. So that's, hmm, that's odd. Uh, no one was ever arrested in these cases. Uh, members of the AAC also used strong arm tactics to extort money from business owners outside of the community. One tactic they had was telling store owners that their present security contractors were not adequate. And if the business was like, no, no, we're good. We don't need you as a security contractor. Then they would just uh, have people rob the business and keep robbing it until they would get a 5,000 per week contract. So, you know, even took a page from the mob there. Dude was a fucking gangster when he wanted to be. Uh, there were also bank robberies, a lot of mysterious bank robberies, approximately 20 bank robberies uh, attributed to a group called the Shotgun Gang. All the members of this gang were AAC members, but the FBI was unable to trace any of the proceeds of the Shotgun Gang directly back to Dwight York. So again, a little suspicious. There were also less violent means used for the AAC endeavors. Uh, bringing cash in was everyone's job. If, if you didn't bring in cash, group leaders turned their uh, the violence back on the members themselves. In Brooklyn, men went out, again, sold books, incest on the street. I talked about that. I didn't mention that if they didn't bring in their $100 a day, they got beat. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, women worked in the community in the shops, offices, or caring for children for free. They also generated money for the group through welfare fraud. Some of the women would uh, uh, were told to apply for welfare using their American names and different addresses. Another scheme was having a pregnant woman share samples of her urine with women who were not pregnant to fake a pregnancy and get public assistance benefits from that. So some next level work in the system there. Um, but the main idea was to sell York's pamphlet books because they, God, they were so good. By the late 1980s, York claimed to have authored more than 200 religious and ideological books, which is really impressive because they were just so well-written. Uh, here are some fun titles I didn't mention earlier. Is God a wimp? <laughs> the fallacy of Easter, Santa or Satan? Was Christ really crucified? Who, what, and where is the devil? <laughs> These feel like books marketed towards like a seven-year-old. Uh, Christianity, the political religion, the sex life of Muslim. Okay, these are a little more adult. Uh, did the hog come for mankind? Uh, haven't had a chance to read all these. Uh, haven't had a chance to read the undoubtable page turner that is who, what, and where is the devil? Uh, I'm going to guess white dudes. Uh, it's all about white dudes. Uh, wh <laughs> what an odd guy, Dwight York. Man, low-down gangster, weird theology slash sci-fi author, wannabe R&B star, fake prophet, pedo. Uh, the many books York wrote were printed on expense inexpensive paper stock in black and white. One woman asked York why the books were printed on such poor quality paper. <laughs> and the answer he gave her was that if the books fell apart, then the customers would buy new ones faster. Wow, oh, genius. What interesting business logic. I'm not sure that normally works. I'm not sure that like Starbucks get away with that. Boss, I have a genius idea. What if 
and hear me out, we start serving our drinks in really flimsy cups that will completely disintegrate in about 15 minutes. I know, I know. That means in roughly 15 minutes, our customers are going to lose their drinks. They're probably going to spill all over them, maybe burn them, their vehicles, going to get all over their desk, ruin their computer. And yeah, it's going to make them mad. Probably will. And, and that might not seem good. But here's the genius part. Here's, here's a page I took from Dwight York. Then they're going to need to buy more coffee. And we just sell them another cup of coffee that also disintegrates. And we just keep the nonstop buying a coffee train, chugging along, choo-choo, cha-ching. Clear out my desk. Okay, not the response I was expecting. Uh, hard for me to fathom how he could sell so many of these books and how the, some people thought they were so fucking good they would buy a second or third copy. <sighs> as you gathered from the samples I shared earlier, as you probably gathered, they're really not well written. Uh, here, here's a reminder of how bad they are. The following excerpt comes from another doc, Dr. Malachi Z. York classic piece of very important literature titled Extraterrestrials and Creation. Those who fell down, Nephilims, to the planet Earth is that same period of time were the shaggy giants. Maybe it was giants. It might have been giants. Uh, Syrians, genus Homo, from the six sun, six star constellation Orion. The disagreeable Elohim after the rape of the Adamite Dogon tribe's daughters. The sons of the agreeable Elohim Anunnaki, 23 Seraphim from the Rizik. Eighth planet in the 19th galaxy called Illuin was sent here to breed amongst the mortals when they had sexual intercourse with the daughters of the Adamites and gave birth to children with a dual nature, Homo erectus. These Gibor mighty ones were very powerful because they were the sons and daughters of the Elohim Anunnaki who had existed for what it seems to be an eternity. 600 Anunnaki had come to the earth from out there by 12 ships of 50 passenger ships. What? What? Out of the mothership. There's a lot of ships, everybody. Called Nibiru. <laughs> so what the fuck was that you just heard? That was Dr. York's very interesting, creative, and supposedly correct translation. I didn't say that part of Genesis 6-4. Excuse me, Genesis 6-4 from the Bible. Yeah, that nonsense was supposedly a biblical translation full of so many misspellings. Like even Anunnaki is like weirdly spelled... Uh, I read the words as they were spelled. <laughs> and also every single word there was capitalized. Here's the New Living Translation of the same shit I just said that from his translation. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. So, I mean, a little crazy, but not as crazy as what I just said. And not nearly as long. He added so much. Here's the classic King James Version. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into unto the came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same mighty, the same became mighty men. King James is always it's a weird rhythm. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So again, you know, it's like he added a lot of shit in his translation, <laughs> and him adding so much, so much, uh, made me imagine York working side by side with say like a Japanese translator. Like how funny of a translator would he be? I'm picturing him working side by side with a Japanese translator for some American English speaking businessman, right? Who uh, wants two translators for whatever reason, just to make sure he's getting it right. And then uh, and the Japanese businessman says to him in Japanese, we're happy to announce we'd like to move forward with the acquisition as long as the audit doesn't turn up anything unexpected. And then the first translator repeats exactly that in English. And then Dwight, who, who somehow works as a translator, even though he doesn't even speak Japanese, <laughs> he just says some craziness. He just says, We'll be implementing a Stargate intergalactic portal transport system as soon as possible, followed by time traveling to ancient Babylonia to harvest Anunnaki adrenochrome that we can pair with tech advances from the future to allow human consciousness to be transferred into the digital space and then downloaded into a synthetic humanoid form, a vessel properly built for cosmic exploration by black and only black Nubian astronauts. So yeah, I mean, that's what he really said. And look, I don't want to throw anyone in the bus, but I really feel like my coworker, he fucking missed so much. So many important details with his translation. Uh, the content of these books, obviously, is fucking just insanity. Uh, seeing them makes them even dumber. Random sentences are capitalized or put in bold. Uh, York alternates quotes from the Bible with the Quran. Sometimes it seems Christian-based, sometimes Islamic, sometimes Jehovah's Witness, sometimes Illuminati, all over the place. Uh, the most sold book he wrote was a 44-page track called 666 Leviathan, right? The first of that four-parter, that page burner I read an excerpt from earlier. Uh, that book's main thrust is presenting an argument that the white race is inherently satanic 
I'll be. Uh, it says the white man had convinced black people that they had a chance for freedom if they made enough money, but then there would be no freedom given. And this found a receptive audience among those who thought they were shut out economically from access to the American dream. Sadly, those who joined York's cult would soon find out that white America had nothing on the AAC when it came to oppressing African-Americans. Uh, men and women lived in separate buildings. When they wanted to have sex, they were forced to ask permission. Then they had to use a designated room. Sex with one's spouse was a privilege granted only when one's duties had been performed satisfactorily. Did you make enough money that day? Okay, then I guess you get to have sex with your wife in the special sex room today. But York could fuck your wife whenever. Uh, York used the group as his personal harem. He was effectively able to have sex with any woman in the cult he wanted. He, uh, again, he impregnated so many, possibly around 200 before it was said and done, all said and done, including many who were underage. York, like so many cult leaders, so obsessed with sex. Dude even wrote a sort of sex manual, a 1980 pamphlet book entitled The Sex Life of a Muslim. Mostly a glossary of sexual terms and practices and practices that do not conform in any way with Muslim theology. <laughs> For example, he spends eight pages <laughs> defending the practice of anal sex. <laughs> uh, I gotta look into another excerpt here. And remember, this is, <laughs> this is supposedly a godly religious book pamphlet, like, like something like your minister would read to you. He says, the technique for anal sex is different from ordinary penetration. With the female kneeling, head well down, carefully lubricate the glands penis, which can be done with any type of baby oil or Vaseline. Insertion into the anus must be done gradually, not as one would do in the vagina thrust. Place the glands to the area and press gently and steadily while the female bears down so you can enter. Proceed slowly into her. The male can work on her breasts and clitoris meanwhile. Once tried, it may become a part of your sex menu. <laughs> I love that he writes that you can work on her breasts meanwhile. You know, if you want. Imagine <laughs> imagine your pastor, if you have one, reading, reading shit like that at church, which isn't that different from York writing it in a religious book for his followers. Just <laughs> in the middle of a sermon, just, hey guys, Hey everybody, let's talk about anal sex for a second, right? Let's talk about, listen, the Christian way. Fellas, when you're slowly pushing your baby oil dick into a lady butt, maybe throw them titties some love, you know? And remember, just because you're, uh, you know, a good Christian doesn't mean you can't work on that clit when you're knocking out that rear pussy door. <laughs> Enjoy eating off the back page of that sex menu. Hey, man. Uh, anal sex is forbidden in traditional Islam, by the way. This book has nothing to do with Muslim doctrine. I'm guessing you knew that. I wanted to make it clear. Ah, oh, this guy's so crazy. In the same book, York also defines pedophilia, the crime that would eventually bring him down as a white plot to destroy black children. Okay. And he sanctions polygamy. He also lists some interesting uh, virtues Muslim women must possess, writing, always she be clean. <laughs> always she be smelling good in his <laughs> Muslim sex book. Just like Allah said, ladies, always she be smelling good. You know, one of God's least favorite things is a stinky front butt. He hates false idols, adulterers, blasphemers, murderers, and stinky front butts. Not necessarily in that order. Praise be to Allah. Uh, let's get back to some dates now. Jumping back into 1979. <laughs> the AAC may have been responsible for a murder this year, or really several murders, which often leads to a cult being brought down, but not the case for the AAC. Uh, on the morning of April 19th, 1979, Horace Green drives away from his single family brick home on Bushwick Ave just down the block and across the street from the AAC mosque. Horace was the founder and head of the Bushwick Improvement Society and the go-to guy for any residents who had complaints about AAC members. Horace drove three blocks to the community and daycare center he operated on Hart Street about 7 a.m. As soon as he got out of his car, a man jumped from a hiding place behind a dumpster, shot Horace four times in the back, killed him. The man stumbled past eyewitnesses as he ran away, the shooter. They told police he had a beard, knee-length black coat, black cap, and pants, silver earring from, uh, dangling from his left ear. He was dressed exactly like someone from the AAC would be dressed that time. Uh, the police investigation would stall and peter out. At first, some people, including Cora Green, Horace Green's widow, thought it would be too obvious for the killer to be an AAC member. She thought that someone was dressing up like them to throw suspicion on the group. No one could think of why Horace Green had been shot. He was a member of the district planning board, vice president of the community school board, a board member of a council that governed the area's Boy Scout troops, amongst other things. He was well-liked by everyone, almost Turns out Horace had recently used his position on the planning board to oppose the AAC's plan to buy an abandoned hospital and convert it into housing for more members. And I think that decision cost him his life. Uh, the case went cold for a while before winding up on NYPD homicide detective Bill Clark's desk. 
who couldn't believe that everyone had ignored what seemed like a neon fucking sign pointing directly at the AAC. But he couldn't question anyone involved in the AAC. That damn uh, New York City sensitive site policy required that he not only make an appointment in advance to see York, but also the meeting had to take place on York's turf. Clark also had to arrange to be accompanied by a community relations officer due to all these obstacles and York constantly just manipulating the system to never set up a meeting. Clark ended up closing his investigation. Then nearly 20 years later, 1998, an FBI intelligence report on York identified the person they believed to be Horace Green's murderer, one of York's most trusted aides, a member of his inner circle, Roy Savage. And this dude, cold-blooded, truly lived up to his name, savage as fuck. Gonna take a real interesting and disturbing AAC side road for a bit now. Shortly after the murder of Horace Green, Roy Savage, or Hashim as he was known in the AAC, moves out of an AAC building in Brooklyn. Gonna lay low for a while, he moves to Newark, New Jersey, takes three women from the AAC with him, his cult wives. Savage forces them to sell incense and oils on the streets of Newark to raise money for him. The sales allow them, allow them to live in a luxury apartment. Uh, the woman who made the most sales each day would be allowed to sleep with him that night. York taught him well. When a family member of one of the women confronted him about abusing her, Savage made that woman lick the sidewalk in front of her relatives. Yee! Dude was a real dirty motherfucker, just like his mentor. Uh, one night in September 1983, Carolyn Hubbard, one of his wives, did something Savage thought was disobedient. A fight started. Savage went into a rage, ended up stabbing Carolyn in the neck and killing her. Another woman, Jackie Cobb, tried to intervene, and for that, she gets stabbed to death as well. An eight-year-old girl named Hasa Kima, daughter of Carolyn's sister Cheryl, was there at the time of the killings. Savage uh, yells at her to go to the bedroom while he drags the bodies into the bathroom, butchers the corpses. Cheryl Hubbard then helps with the cleanup of her sister's body. Savage hacks the two bodies into pieces, then packs the parts into suitcases. And then to terrorize the remaining women into silence, this motherfucker actually cooks some of the body parts in the stove, makes them eat bits of their former roommate's flesh, makes one woman eat part of her sister. To distract from the smell, he lights over a hundred scented candles in the apartment. A couple days later, he loads up the suitcases, takes them down to his car. The security guard in the lobby writes in his logbook, stink, stink, stink. But beyond that, he sadly doesn't do or report anything. Uh, Savage takes the staircases to an apartment in Harlem, then proceeds to just party for a while. Who the fuck is this guy? Acting real casual for a dude with a few suitcases full of murder victim body parts in his possession. He tries to buy some drugs at the party, but the deal goes bad. He gets thrown out of a second story window. He gets a concussion and is hospitalized. Too bad he doesn't die when he hits the ground. Meanwhile, smoke from all those candles he lit is billowing out of Savage's apartment window. Someone calls the fire department. When firefighters put out the candles, one of them notices a suitcase with weird fluids seeping out of the bottom, but doesn't do anything about it. Meanwhile, someone goes to the hospital to tell Savage that the fire department has been, has been at his house. Savage freaks out, pulls out his IV, rushes back home wearing nothing but his hospital gown. Uh, so after seeing the strange man moving suitcases, a neighbor gets suspicious and calls the police because he goes to like, you know, move the body parts again. The police then find bloodstains in the empty apartment, but no bodies. He's still getting away with it. Savage, uh, he still has these suitcases. He hasn't like thrown them in a dumpster yet. Now he takes at least one of these suitcases back to Newark, uh, to uh, a public housing project in Newark that's being decommissioned. Three people on the elevator there with him. He doesn't even wait for like a different elevator. He's like, yeah, I'll just get on and bring these body parts. They note the horrible smell. They don't do anything. They report it to no one. He's still getting away with this. Two or three days later, residents in the apartment building complain about the smell. A maintenance man finds the suitcase, takes it downstairs, tosses it into a dumpster. There it pops open. And finally, someone's like, holy shit, there's body parts in there. I should probably call the police. Finally, authorities are notified. Detective Eusti from New York PD is brought in. He tracks down Cheryl Hubbard and Cheryl's daughter to a neighborhood in Morningside Heights called Little Newark. People there tell him about the AAC in Bushwick. They also tell him that the woman, women of the AAC are basically being held as sex slaves and that Dwight York is their pimp. But once again, an investigation of the AAC gets held up by the NYPD who allow York to forbid UST from going into their buildings because of that fucking stupid law they had at the time. A UST, a black officer, figures out a way to, go, to get around it, though. He just puts on a robe and walks in like he's a member. Bingo, bingo, nice thinking, Officer Eusti. Uh, inside, he finds Cheryl, explains to her her legal situation, gets her to agree to have her daughter become a witness for the prosecution, right? The eight-year-old who saw this, she follows through, and Officer Eusti gets Savage convicted to life in fucking prison. Hail Nimrod, a little bit of good news in this tale. Crazily, Cheryl Hubbard, after helping convict Savage, will then visit him in prison for years. Still love the psycho who slaughtered her sister in front of her daughter and then fed her some of the body. And this guy was part of York's inner circle. York now tries to minimize his association with Savage. Meanwhile, three former members of the AAC will later tell investigators that Savage frequently would write letters to York from prison. 
uh, most of them barely coherent expressions of undying loyalty to York. Unfortunately, York's connection to Savage and those three murders that shed light on York being known in the area as a pimp will not bring York and his cult down. On the early 80s now, York, now in his late 30s, really starts to focus again <laughs> on his music career. Oh, that was cracks me up. He keeps going back and forth. He'll like, you know, focus on being a co-leader then focus on being a musician. Uh, he now performs as a vocalist with uh, Jackie and the Starlights and, uh, and another group called The Students. He launches his own record label, Passion Productions, and records as a solo artist, Dr. York. His debut release was uh, that single, Only a Dream, from that sweet, sweet album we heard a preview of earlier, New York. Noise. Uh, his musical career does not explode, but Dr. York and Passion Productions do get advertised in the May 4th, 1985 issue of Billboard magazine. So he makes it a little farther than Manson. You know, Father Yo, David Koresh, the others. Uh, back it up to 1983, uh, York's cult moves uh, its headquarters from Bushwick to Sullivan County, New York, to a site they now call Camp Jazir Abba, 115 miles north, the head upstate near the town of Parksville in the Catskill Mountains. York has uh, bought an 80 acre property for $145,000 that becomes their camp. According to one of York's sons, he spends about $5 million to build a uh, lavish mansion on the land, complete with a swimming pool and, of course, a recording studio gotta stay focused on making that sweet, silky music. York ordered that his main house be built with the wing encompassing two trailers where women and children would be housed and a secret passageway uh, was built between the trailers and the house so he could, you know, sneak them in whenever he wanted. There were virtually no full-time neighbors, but across the lake, bordering the property was a hunting and fishing lodge owned by one Phil Mullins and Phil noticed that there uh, wasn't any sign of the new occupant's religious affiliations. You would uh, note this later talking to investigators. There was nothing to indicate they were Muslims. York and the rest of the group were already moving away from their Islamic ideology. Uh, they did erect some Native American-style totem poles, though. So that's interesting. He also notices that the men of the group seem to uh, have an obsession with guns, frequently hear sustained bursts of gunfire in the woods, so that's fun. Uh, besides the guns, York also starts messing around more openly with girls at this place. Phil Mullins, other local residents, starting to become suspicious about the number of girls and young women that could be seen around the camp. They would arrive by the van load and would stay for a while in those trailers attached to the house but you would never see them in town. Uh, in the group, these girls were known as the Backstreet Girls, the ones York had allowed to spend extra time and have extra privileges at his recording studio back in uh, Bushwick called Backstreet. At a basement room in Backstreet, the girls were free from the, from the women who normally babysat them, uh, babysat them free from the normal cult rules. They got to wear regular clothes, even short skirts, sometimes have boys join them. One girl named Aldura was blown away by the culture at Backstreet. It was the first time she'd ever seen York act like a regular human being. She would later say, the first time I saw Doc drinking something, I thought, like, you can eat and drink? I thought you were like Jesus. Then one of York's concubines started the process of educating Aldura about what was expected of her in return for all her new privileges as a Backstreet Girl. Uh, the woman told her she needed to be prepared for relations with her eventual husband. And in their spiritual homeland, Sudan, the woman claimed, such practical lessons about sex were given by male relatives, uncles, and fathers <laughs> all the time. It's not even a big deal. Uh, the woman used a plastic dildo to show the proper way for her to give a blowjob. She showed her porn. One day, this concubine lady told Aldura to dance nude, and she videotaped it for York. Holy shit. He has female cult members brainwashed into helping him molest girls. And so weird about the customs back in Africa. And, and she's right there. You know, there are some very different sexual customs in certain parts of the world and in certain parts of uh, Africa, especially in the, in the past, certain indigenous areas. Uh, but York, not living in those parts. Not part of that culture. Doing what he's doing, you know, here is like, it's like, that's like kidnapping somebody and force them to work for you and rationalize like, oh, come on, it's okay. You know, people used to have slaves. I'm just living like people used to live. You know, what's the problem? A lot of problems, a lot of problems. A uh, few people in the AAC community now know or have suspicions that York is having sex with the Backstreet Girls. One woman is approached by a 15 year old girl who tells her that York is having sex with her, but the woman finds it hard to believe the girl saying, why would he sacrifice all this to do something like that? So people hear about it, but they don't want to accept it. By this time, it's uh, more or less common knowledge that York is sleeping with anyone in the community whenever he wants. And uh, so people, you know, because of that, they're like, well, he gets to sleep with all these grown women. Why would he also start going after underage girls? Because he's a fucking sexual predator and they're never satisfied. They always want more, right? Always, wants, always want what's forbidden. Uh, the Backstreet Girls keep quiet for the most part about what's going on. They're rewarded for their sexual service by being given high status within the cult. They're rewarded for keeping secrets. You know, they get to go to Camp Jazir. They get to eat pizza and soda, listen to popular music. Listen to York's fucking shitty disco R&B stuff. And because of all these privileges, when York summons them for sex over the intercom, they go. Despite these girls not running around telling everyone what's going on, more and more people, again, though, are figured it out. Malik, one of York's sons, one day is searching through his father's things at Camp Jazeera and he finds a video. 
Uh, it's marked with one of the names of the Backstreet Girls, a girl that he had a crush on, Aldura. He watches this video, which shows her dancing nude. He confronts her like, what the fuck is going on? Her response is blunt and unashamed. She tells him straight up, I gave your father a blowjob last night. Holy shit, imagine hearing that from someone that you had a crush on about your dad. Aldura is 15 when York initiates her. First, he has her perform oral sex on him. Then he has anal sex with her. Sometime he videotapes their encounters or has a concubine videotape it. Uh, the ones who gave him sex without complaining get better food and sometimes little presents. Those who refuse get cut off. He would also disparage the non-compliant girls in front of others, stoking rivalries. The ones who were good got more authority. For example, some of them got notes that had handwritten orders, which the girls would be instructed to deliver to other girls. Some of them were even eviction notices. They got to tell other girls just to fucking get out. He also told the girls that their parents didn't care about them. He did, right? He broke them down, made them feel unwanted, unloved. Then he showered them with affection while also molesting them. He manipulated them into being happy with sexual attention because, you know, that felt better than feeling unloved. It's a fucking predator. Uh, what he didn't tell them is that they were cut off from their parents by rules York himself had established. Making adults work 12-hour days, house them in separate quarters from the children. Uh, after his relationship with Aldura had gone on for a while, York asked her to bring him her stepsister, Jokara, who was only eight, and then another girl who was only six. He later told Aldura that the younger children were accomplished in performing oral sex on him. What the fuck? So many kids would be molested at Camp Tazir. An untold amount. Uh, while York continues to molest, he also starts moving away from Islam further and further. He stops showing up at Islamic naming ceremonies, uh, stops speaking in Arabic, starts wearing jeans, dressing like a normal dude, wearing Western wear, because of all this, his son Malik, and uh, you know he's still pretty mad about the uh, blowjob thing, starts to speak out against his dad to others in the community, some of whom encourage him to take leadership of the group from himself. His mom, Zubeda, counsels him to respect his father, even though she herself would frequently get into arguments with York about his harem of girls. Uh, Malik would later describe things as uh, descending into kind of a civil war. He gets into several arguments with his dad. During one such argument, York threatens another son with an ice pick, and Malik then brandishes a gun at his dad, but doesn't pull the trigger. But after that, he knows it's time to go. He knows if he uh, if he isn't willing to kill his dad, his dad is probably going to have him killed. Uh, Zubeda leaves with him. So do some other followers, but plenty of followers sadly stay. Uh, by the mid to late 80s, York is now living uh, upstate almost full time, almost done with Bushwick. He seems to have taken the gas pedal off of being a spiritual leader. Needs a break. Needs to focus on his music. Opens a record store in the Sullivan County seat, Liberty. Also starts passing around flyers promoting music related ventures, which included a new recording studio and a talent and modeling agency. One of his clients was the hot female R&B group, She. Another was Petite, described as four young ladies who sing their hearts out. And a promotional material, an all-female group that York considers his children. Blech. In a personal bio released by York in 1986, he claimed that he was also pondering a rap reggae group consisting of three girls called Undercover Lovers. So he's really not into the religious stuff right now. Uh, he was continuing to promote himself as well. You know, Dr. York. <laughs> One 1985 promotional article read, Passion Records, Dr. York certainly looks like one hell of a romantic dude. The white dinner jacket, gold medallions, silk handkerchief, and wet look hair must surely be enough to turn any woman wild. Uh, I'm guessing because that was grammatically correct, he had somebody else write it. Also needing to seem larger than life, he explained to his followers that he was uh, focusing on international markets, right? He was super popular abroad. Hello? Okay, I know you're not hearing me on the radio here in the U.S., but I'm very popular in countries you don't know about. He said U.S. record labels wouldn't sign him because they were afraid of his power as a black man. And he said this even though another black man, Michael Jackson, <laughs> just released the best-selling album of all time, Thriller, just three years earlier. So that's awkward. 1988, York's criminal history gets a little update. Not much, but he's convicted of obtaining a passport with a false birth certificate. <laughs> Sorry, U.S. Customs. It's, it's so hard to keep track of what's real when you've lied so much about who you are. Uh, Dwight York changes his name legally in 1990, again, to Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. He's back with the Islam, kind of, not really. He starts to, uh, um, in the late 80s, starts mixing in ancient Egypt, Egyptian and Native American themes into his pseudo-religious fucking nonsense, into his book pamphlets. <laughs> changes his name a few more times. It's a real schiz schizophrenic time for the cult. Everyone's having a hard time keeping track of what the fuck they're supposed to believe in right now. The, the glue keeping this batshit crazy cult together is the unrelenting theme that never wavers of black supremacy. Sometimes you might be worshiping an Egyptian god, sometimes a Muslim god, sometimes a Christian god, sometimes American Indian gods. Sometimes, you know, you're worshiping, you know, York himself. You might not know what's coming next, but you always know that white people are devils and that you're the fucking best. Uh, a move to Georgia starts being discussed. Soon York's cult will enter their final incarnation, uh, the United Nuwabian Nation of Morse. 
Uh, York also keeps uh, collecting wives around this time. In 1991, a young woman who had come to be called Badra had some time to kill while she waited for a bus in Liberty, New York. She went to York Records, his music store. There was a poster of The Love Doctor on a wall. And in the back of the store, what? Oh my God, The Love Doctor is here in the only store that has a poster of him on earth. The manager approached her and said that The Love Doctor wanted her number. But Badra, she didn't give it to him. Not right away. She's 20. She's a mother of a two-year-old and a four-year-old. She's too busy for dating. But then a couple weeks later, she keeps thinking about the love doctor. She reconsiders. She gives the store manager her number, and York gives her a call. And for a while, she works at the record store. She dates Dr. Love. But then business declines, and York tells her he can't afford to pay her anymore. But he can't afford to marry her. He says she'll become wife number 19. <laughs> Not kidding. That's a sales pitch. Listen, baby. You're going to become my wife, number 19. I wonder if he says that last part quiet. Baby, I love you so much. I want you to be my wife, number 19. God, I can't wait till we're married for the 19th time. Uh, he says that she'll be number one in his heart. What a romantic sales pitch. Uh, Badra takes him up on it. She and her daughters move to Camp Desir, and then she slowly comes to realize she's not number one. She's definitely number 19. She's one of a faceless harem of women who sleeps in rooms taken up with stacks of bunk beds. She works long hours as a seamstress while her kids are babysat by other women. Around this time, late 1991, early 1992, uh, the country life starts to disagree with York. Sullivan County authorities start to get a little more suspicious of him than those in Bushwick had been. He's getting frustrated with authorities that he can't build whatever he wants on his land. And uh, once the county takes him to court on uh, some illegal construction and, uh, you know, has an order put in to stop illegal construction, he's also facing a tax bill in the neighborhood of $200,000. He doesn't want to pay it. So now he wants to get out of Sullivan County. But where to go? He can't return to Brooklyn. The FBI down there is starting to investigate him for a variety of claims of various criminal activities. He also has some debts uh, associated with Brooklyn businesses. They're growing and more and more disagreements with some of his cult members who don't care about his music career. In late 1992, he tells one of his many wives to start looking for properties in and around Atlanta. Just before closing on a complex of apartment buildings, another wife, Kathy Johnson, finds a 400 you know, plus acre tract of pasture and woodlands for sale in the central part of the state. The asking price, a little less than a million dollars. The man selling the property, Arnie Lassen, uh, they would negotiate the sales of the first months of 1993. They reach an agreement on the selling price. York agrees to pay about half of the purchase price in cash, and then Lassen would finance the rest. But there's a sticking point. Lassen wants to be able to come onto the property after the sale since he's financing part of the deal. York offers him an extra 200000 in cash if he'll just stay away and never come on the property. <laughs> Not suspicious at all. Lassen is uneasy about this. He contacts a friend in the FBI, asks him to make some inquiries into York. The friend tells him about the New York law enforcement uh, contacts he finds that are interested in York. After finding a few things out, the friend advises Lassen to be careful. Might not be a great idea to back out of a deal with this guy. Some bad things happened to some people in Brooklyn who tried to do that. Uh, Lassen's scared now, and he goes through with the deal and sells the land. February of 1993, York announces that in two days, he and a select group of followers are heading to Georgia. The others are told to wait until they are called for. He leaves behind $100,000 in unpaid bills. To pay the bills, he uh, orders the group to reprint one of his best-selling books, Leviathan 666. <laughs> See, he claims that that paid the debt back. There's no fucking way. There's no way that shitty of a book that reads like it was written by a mentally ill fifth grader could sell enough copies to pay for a nice dinner. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, um, I gotta hope not. Um, anyway, York and his, uh, his uh, favorite girls now head down to Georgia and the rest are left to rot. They are, many of them are never called for. He leaves behind a bunch of women and children at Camp Desir, around 60 people living in uh, double-wide trailers that have been the harem's quarters. The power in the main lodge is shut off. Most of the windows are pulled out and shipped south. He actually takes the windows down south. Uh, <laughs> there was nothing to do for these people in the middle of the winter there. A line for the one working bathroom was uh, crowded with people 24 hours a day. People tried to wash their clothes, but they never fully dried in the cramped quarters. Their psychotic Maasai had abandoned them. York didn't care. He was off to bigger and better things. He was off to Georgia, busy creating yet another identity for himself. Dwight changed his name again in 1993 to Malachi York. He also adopts a number of uh, other titles and pseudonyms, including the Supreme Grand Master, Dr. Malachi C. York. <laughs> Wasn't enough to be doctor. Supreme Grand Master and uh, Naya Malazi. Uh, it's just like a made-up word. Uh, it throws a bunch of letters together. Uh, the relative isolation of his new land in Georgia appealed to him greatly. The largest town in the region is Eatonton. Uh, population 6,764 in 2000. And even this town was miles away from his secluded new compound. Uh, at this new compound, he got busy revising his theology again. Islam pretty much out now. He wants something new, right? Something, uh, you know, with significant uh, pageantry, his costumery, 
that his followers uh, can you know produce, buy, and wear. In the first few years in Georgia, York tries out a few different combinations of looks and ideology. He starts off with a cowboy and Indian theme. Not kidding. <laughs> Locals would later talk about seeing his followers uh, first show up in the area by the busload, dressed like they'd just been cast in some kind of fucking John Wayne movie remake. Big 10-gallon hats, uh, big old belt buckles, cowboy boots, wranglers, all that stuff. Some of them dressed up like American Indians, like a caricature, mo- moccasins, feathers in their hair. I've seen pics of York in full headdress, like he's some big chief. So weird. A bunch of cult members who don't even know what religion they're a part of. Moved to Georgia from New York to play weird dress-up games. York starts proclaiming himself to be Chief Black Eagle now, uh, telling his followers they're the modern-day incarnation of the lost tribe of the uh, Yamasee group, a group of American Indians who resisted the early waves of European colonization and disappeared from history. Uh, we mentioned them in the Trail of Tears suck recently. Uh, there, there was a mythical link York claimed between his tribe and a site in northern Putnam County called Rock Eagle, about 10 miles from York's property, a place where mounds built by prehistoric American Indians were preserved. York really sold this. The cowboy, and, uh, although York really sold this, the cowboy and Indian movie was not a big hit with his followers because he wanted everybody you know, to stay in costume. They were supposed to dress up in uniform when they left the land. Uh, but then these groups moseying around Eatonton with their 10-gallon hats and their new boots, they stood out a wee bit and they got embarrassed to be seen outside the compound like that. <laughs> I love it. I picture these people just saying to locals like, ah, sorry, I just look, I don't normally dress this way. I know it's weird. But my boss, he's real big on it. He's watching a lot of gun smoke. And uh, look, I don't want to be wearing a giant belt buckle that says peanut on it, but I don't even like peanuts. But that's his call, you know? So he goes back to the drawing board. And he, uh, the next year, they trade in their 10 gallon hats for red fezes. And they call the settlement the ancient mystical order of <sighs> Milk is <laughs> Milch is a deck. A fez is a uh, flat top uh, conical red hat with a tassel on top, worn by Muslims in some countries. Also, what the Shriners wear. Uh, this look does not stick either. I'm surprised he also didn't insist that they uh, only use those little tiny uh, Schrander cars for getting around, uh, for, you know, for transportation. Too expensive, maybe. Uh, now he comes up with the United Nation of Nuwabian Moors. One part Egyptian motif, one part intergalactic bullshit. <laughs> the Egyptian angle lets him uh, turn the front part of his property on Shadydale Road into a small-scale recreation of Egypt. On the ideological side, instead of casting himself as a Muslim prophet, now York starts claiming he's a supernatural being sent from the planet, R- planet Rizik to save a chosen few. Salvation would come via spaceship, uh, and York decides who gets to board. York, of course, gets to, uh, you know, quickly write in some new pamphlet books to build out his new ideology. One of his followers, former Backstreet Girl, hands over $100,000 from a car accident settlement to pay for the printing. The new tome is called The Holy Tablets, and the woman who helps York write it essentially goes to some bookstores, buys a bunch of New Age books, and then copies random paragraphs, word for word. There's a ton of plagiarism in it, but he, but he does add some new stuff. Uh, the planet... Planet Rizik shit he comes up with on his own. Uh, he states that he comes from a planet called Rizik in the great galaxy of Ilium. I mentioned some of this stuff earlier. He describes a war on Rizik that happened when Humbaba, a uh, type of warring being, attacks Rizik with a shield depleter, and the bomb causes the natural atmosphere of Rizik to, um, you know, deplete, because that's what shield depleters do. They deplete things. You get it. The inhabitants of Rizik, the Rizikians, they have to leave their planet now in search of gold dust, uh, which they intend to use to build a dome over a new planet to thwart, uh, no, over their current planet, uh, sorry, I know this is really important, to thwart future attacks. Because, you know, that's what gold dust does. It helps you build a space shield. <laughs> Anyone who's ever built a space shield knows that, I, like me. Uh, York would now claim that he incarnates from time to time for those who are in need of my presence in the flesh. I am an angelic being, an Elohim. He tells followers he had apparently visited Earth in three separate forms. As a human born in 1945, I just can't imagine him saying this shit with a straight face. Being the most recent one, while he was in his mother's womb, he said he was implanted with three candles that glowed glowed with green light, a sign of his mental and spiritual ability. God, his poor mom. That must have hurt, giving birth to a baby full of candles. Uh, He writes, We have been coming to this planet before it had your life form on it. My incarnation as in Elah, Mutajasid, or Avatara, fucking whatever, was originally in the year of 1945 AD. In order to get here, I traveled by one of the smaller passenger crafts called Sham out of a mother plane called Merkababa <laughs> Nibiru. I wonder if part of his like just ridiculous words is in like, it's kind of like um, Lovecraftian where like no one's going to be able to say them, but then he gets to act like super arrogant when you can't pronounce it right. You know, like the, the mother plane, like Merkababa, he's like, <laughs> Merkababa, no, Merkababa, that's how you say it if you weren't stupid. Um, so, you know, it's all pretty well thought out. 
Uh, this version of York came to Earth on March 16th, 1970. Interesting. So he just showed up. Okay. He didn't show up in 1945. He showed up in 1970. Uh, Comet Bennett, which was visible on that date, is said to have really been York's spacecraft. So he goes from showing up on Earth in 1945 to suddenly showing up on Earth in 1970. He's basically ripping off Heaven's Gate now in some ways. I feel like he must have got his hands on some of Marshall Applewhite's literature around this time. Right? Heaven's Gate. Big into comets. Uh, Hill Bop, you know, uh, they committed suicide uh, to board a spaceship traveling behind that comet in 1997, just four years after this. They've been around since the 70s, peddling their weird aliens and religion bullshit. York taught his followers now that the mother plane Nibiru would launch the crystal city of New Jerusalem to our solar system from its position in Orion. Come on, pay attention. Simple stuff here. A 40-year process of taking the 144,000 chosen few, taking a page from Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, beliefs here, uh, 12,000 each from the 12 tribes of Israel, into the planet craft Nibiru began on August 12, 2003, or will begin. And then the process will end, of course, on August 12, 2043. These chosen few will then be groomed for a thousand years exactly, because people like round numbers. And stay with me. They'll then return to Earth for the final battle against the Luciferians and redeem man from a 6,000 year, again, round numbers, rulership of the devil and his seed. And how did he explain his recent years-long devotion to Islamic-ish beliefs. How did that, does that match up with this? Uh, he, you know, he doesn't. He doesn't really work on that transition and some cult members leave. Uh, the members back in Brooklyn now, uh, a lot of them remain Muslim. They're like, what the fuck? And they just cut ties with them. But a lot of people say, uh, incredible. A couple hundred stay. Eventually, Nuwabian membership in Georgia will reach around 500. How fucking crazy is all this? Imagine going to church, not knowing what religion is going to be preached any given week. <laughs> that is basically what's been happening here. You know, like when the pastor says, open your books, you actually don't know what book it's going to be. You know, you just sit in the pew. One Sunday, you're like, oh, okay, it's a Bible. And then the next Sunday, it's the Quran. And then the next Sunday, it's a fucking Louis L'Amour cowboy book. Uh, then it's Dianetics. Then it's lyrics for some new disco R&B songs. Then it's a translation of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, then it's a screenplay for Predator versus Alien. What is happening? Uh, and you have to dress right for each new belief system. You might show up in cowboy boots, but then you're like, nah, it's not cowboy week. Nope, go to the basement, change into a sci-fi costume, dress up like an astronaut. What he's doing is basically this crazy. <laughs> so after bouncing around for a while, York and his followers, they settle on an Egyptian alien mashup theme, as one does for Georgia. At York's direction, the community formerly known as the AAC and so many other names, now known as the Nuwabian Nation of Moors, builds Tama Ray, originally named, originally named Kaddish, because he likes to fucking change names so much. And Tama Ray is an Egyptian-themed complex built on 476 acres of land near Eatonton, Georgia. Many Nuwabians at Tama Ray will live in cheap trailers, 100 or so, while York lives, of course, in a mansion on the property, and then as many as 400 other Nuwabians live in the surrounding area. Let's explore how ridiculous this place uh, was for a sec. The surrounding area around Shadydale Road, where Tama Ray's entrance was, populated by dairy farms, an auto salvage yard, a couple of modest residences. If you're driving there, you'd pass by farm after farm. Then suddenly, you'd come around a curve in the road, you'd see uh, two 40-foot-high pyramids, one black and one gold next to an enormous obelisk, and, a <laughs> and, a and painted statues of various Egyptian deities. 40-foot-high pyramids out in the middle of Georgia farmland. That'll get your attention. That'll get the neighbors talking. Uh, York would charge Nuwabians $25 a year for their Nuwabian passports, which allowed them to enter and exit this compound. There was a network of chapters and bookstores uh, called All Eyes on Egypt, bringing in cult funds around uh, uh, also this time. Members continue to raise money uh, from begging, holding jobs, giving their money to York. Uh, inside his weird Egyptian compound, people could mill around, eat, shop, explore. Uh, children could ride on the Little Egypt Choo Choo on the public part of the property. Yep. He has a small train on the property for kids, because why not? Uh, the women who lived and worked at Tom Array would wear flowing white robes edged in royal blue. A few yards away, <laughs> away from the highway, visitors would approach a 20-foot-high arched entrance gate with armed guard shacks just inside. The arch was coated with sandstone, colored uh, drivet, basically every inch of which was covered with Egyptian uh, pictograms and illustrations. Visitors had to pay to enter, and they would drive their cars to the gate up a driveway lined with dozens of 10-foot-high statues of Thoth and Anubis. And on, at the top of the driveway was a 10-foot-high ceremonial platform. The cars would, would park on a grassy hillside. Then the visitors could roam the park. Uh, inside one of the pyramids was a gift shop stocked with some of the hundreds of books York claimed to have authored. The covers printed on slick paper. Insides printed on cheap, thin paper like the kind found in comic books. The prices ranged from 5 to 25 bucks. You could also get T-shirts. You could even get action figures of York. <laughs> which went for 50 bucks. You could buy all sorts of shit. But not with American money. Uh-uh. Things that Tom Ray could only be purchased with Tom Ray money. Visitors would have to change their real money 
at the rate of $500 US for $550 Tama Ray dollars, right? And then the Tama Ray dollars would, would be adorned with pictures of Dwight York. He took this shit so far. Uh, the upper floor of the pyramid had been set up as a cafe. Uh, the other pyramid, the black one, was the religious centerpiece of the park. It was surrounded by a concrete plaza on which a wooden maze had been constructed. Visitors would meditate or pray as they wandered through this maze. And then the loudspeakers would play a mix of new age music and like Native American chants and Buddhist chants and fucking whatever, because anything goes. And the major tourist attraction was uh, Club Ramsey. Uh, it would get shut down in 1998 by the Putnam County Sheriff's Department because it did not have a license to operate as a nightclub or sell liquor. Uh, does your does your church have a nightclub that sells liquor? No? Well, then I guess York's religion was more fun than yours. Uh, guests in that nightclub played a shit ton of York's disco music. The exterior of the building, like the other buildings at the park, covered with murals of pharaohs and their chariots. And on the hunt, inside most of the 50 by 100 foot building was a red cement dance floor. There was a circular red velvet covered uh, divan in the middle of the dance floor where dancers could sit. In the middle of that, a red velvet cone rose to the ceiling on top of which was a statue of King Tut. On the wall behind the main stage was a mural depicting the ancient city of Thebes. In the middle of the wall, he's way into Egypt right now. In the middle of the wall was a wheel with red lights running around the perimeter and along the spokes. The ceiling was painted black, scattered with day glow stars. Uh, very over the top. The club was also packed with hundreds of thousands of dollars of state of the art electronic gear. Generators needed to supply enough power for it all. Next to the club was the Hathor recording studio, still trying to become a music mogul. I wonder how many Egyptian disco R&B tracks he recorded that are lost in a vault somewhere. Uh, amid scattered behind these buildings, or and scattered behind these buildings, a dozen or so trailers where somewhere between 100 to 150 full-time Tom Array residents live. Most of the trailers had no AC. Off the main street was a driveway that led down a hill to the property's main house. The house had an exterior of field stone and dark brown wood, making it look like a hunting lodge. And it was a hunting lodge of a kind. He was definitely on the hunt. Most of York's big main house was converted into offices where York's concubines worked 16-hour days keeping his mail-order business and his network of bookstores and schools operating. Yes, he had a mail-order business in bookstores and schools somehow. Beside the main house was, in addition, York's quarters. On the main level was a large glass window where he'd watch women work in the office area. On the second floor was the largest of his private chambers, the floor of the octagon-shaped room, carpeted wall-to-wall -wall with a leopard skin pattern, beige with white stripes, large four-post uh, four bed with a canopy, curtains of black and gold. The adjoining bathroom had a big-ass black marble jacuzzi. There was a black ceramic fire uh, fireplace in the bedroom. In the corner of the room, a spiral staircase carpeted in the same leper print. Um, uh, led upstairs at the base of the staircase was a sign, do not go upstairs. Gosh dang, wonder what's going on up there. A spiral staircase led to a small green carpeted room with a large bed and a plasma screen TV for all the porn he'd watch. And yet another adjoining building, there was another private rest area furnished with a jacuzzi and a bed as well. You know, police would later find a video camera in one corner of that room from he'd make porn. Most of the ceiling was covered with mirrors. Police would also find a life-size stuffed animal that resembled the character of the Pink Panther with a fucking dildo sewn onto the crotch. What is happening? <laughs> what kind of fetishes does this dude have? He liked to watch people get fucked by a stuffed Pink Panther. Oh my God, of course, the uh, Pink Panther with the dildo would later become evidence. Uh, 1996, under the name uh, Naya Malachi Zodok York L., York now pu publishes the Holy Tablets. He's writing more books during all this fucking craziness. This would become the Nuwabian Bible, for which he would cl claim divine inspiration. In this theology classic, he styles himself as a messianic figure, expounding on his new UFO religion surrounding the planet Rizik, according to which he himself, as well as Pharaoh, Ramses II, were extraterrestrials. This book is full of shitty photo photoshopped pics. I can't, I can't overestimate how terrible it is. There's these terrible Photoshop pictures of York standing in front of real pyramids like he's supposed to really be there just hanging out in space and shit it's so fucking bad and it opens with the words within the confines of these pages there are facts beyond any doubts thus I came giving you what you want so you would learn to want what I have to give I hate this idiot <laughs> I, I hate that he lives in a mansion right paid for by these the worst written books ever in this new book, he makes a weak attempt to connect Islam to his new Nawabian bullshit, making it seem as if his belief is a logical next step now. Now he's getting to the, you know, connecting the two. It's it's, it's a logical next step of what the Prophet Muhammad and all the prophets before him going back to the Jewish beliefs, you know, wanted. And he really quickly, uh, you know, gets into ancient aliens, Anunnaki, spacers, bullshit, makes a hard turn from Islam into David Icke stuff. Some of the craziest theological shifts I've ever come across studying cults. Despite all this theological insanity, the first couple of years in Putnam County for York's group are uh, pretty good as far as relations with locals go. No hostile conflicts between York's followers and Putnam County officials. 
Locals think they're weird because they are so weird, but they don't you know, cause any noticeable problems. But then when they look back later on it, many locals would remember some strange incidents uh, from the first years of Tom Array. Mary Ann Tanner, then county registrar, head of the planning and zoning department, which was only staffed by two people, uh, approved several Nawabian plans for building, even though the forms weren't filled out right. You know, but she figured making a big deal out of it wouldn't amount to anything. Uh, but she did see something that would dis uh, seriously disturb her when she was checking on some of the property, especially when the sex crimes, other abuses of followers came to light. She saw a Nawabian woman using an unrented storage unit as a resident, stopping by in the mornings late at night, curious Marianne lifted the door to the storage unit, found a small piece of foam bedding, pillow, coloring book, some food, obvious that a small child had been left to spend days living in the storage unit. No running water, not a place to live. Another time she was seriously disturbed when she got a call from the Nawabians, who uh, usually wanted to know things like if they could sell lemonade and burgers on the property. And then in the background, she hears somebody ask if they can bury someone on their property. Uh, she did not report this to the sheriff's office, uh, unfortunately. Sheila, at the time, Sheila Layson, the Putnam County clerk of circuit courts, also saw some stuff. It was sad when she saw it, sadder still when she reflected on it later when his crimes were revealed. She frequently saw Nuavian women come into the courthouse with five or six kids who would then go into the public restroom and emerge later. Uh, the kids were all scrubbed and dressed. They were like, you know, using the sinks for showers in there. York living in his mansion doesn't provide a place on his property for these kids to get clean. Uh, Howard Sills, sheriff of Putnam County, also started to worry about the Nawabians pretty soon. Uh, he, he first saw them dressed up in cowboy costumes, <laughs> ambling around downtown when he was uh, sher uh, chief sheriff's deputy in neighboring Baldwin County. And then after being elected sheriff in Putnam County, he starts receiving some disturbing calls. A frantic mother once uh, calls him and says, my daughter left Howard University to get on the spaceship. Yep. More frantic calls like that start coming in from family members. Then in March 1997, the news of the Heaven's Gate suicides are plastered all over the media. Howard still starts getting seriously worried that he has a similar cult on his hands and he doesn't want a Heaven's Gate-type tragedy to occur in his county on his watch. In the spring of 1998, tension between the Nawabians and locals becomes more public. County seeks an injunction now against Nawabian construction uh, and uses that, uh, they're, you know, they're violating z some zoning laws. One of the group sources of revenue was that nightclub, right, called Club Ramsey's that we talked about earlier, illegally operating in one of the Tom Array pyramids. It actually had been zoned for use as a storage facility. On May 8th, 1998, Sheriff Howard Sills, or Sills moves to shut down the nightclub. 350 to 400 people are living at that time uh, on or right next to Tom Array. As a precaution, Sills stations a reserve of about 40 riot-ready deputies, some barred from nearby counties. He leads a force of 17 deputies into Tom Array. Takes about 30 minutes for the sheriff to post closure notices on the walls of the nightclub, padlock the door, Nawabians videotape these proceedings, complain about violations of their sovereignty. Remember that, right? They think they're living in their own sovereign nation because that's what York's been telling them. Uh, York and the Nawabians see the sheriff's actions as a declaration of war, one country to another. Less than two months after the shutdown of the nightclub, York opens his 1998 Savior's Day Festival. He has a festival every year to celebrate himself. Uh, this is in June. Uh, this is the first and only time he ever lets television crews and newspaper reporters inside his compound. Uh, during this celebration, York reportedly takes in about $500,000 in visitors' fees and merch sales. God damn it. Around 5,000 people show up to witness weird religious ceremonies that feature elaborate, colorful costumes. Way too many books are sold. When reporters ask, Nuwabians claim that their belief system adopts the best from all the holy books of all the major religions. They also say that anything in the holy books that contradicts their right knowledge is just simply wrong. <laughs> it's easy peasy. If, you know, if York wrote it, it's right. On Saturday, the peak day of the festival, York appears, tells the media about his desires to set up his own government, <laughs> operate his own public services and schools, and for all intents and purposes, you know, have his own separate society, which his followers need because of the harsh racism, racism they endure outside his group. Following these declarations, Nawabians start showing up in large groups in nearly every local small town governmental meeting in the area, like that of the planning and zoning board. They turn these meetings into heated, tense confrontations. These poor local officials can't imagine having to deal with these maniacs. Sheriff Howard Sills is sent a number of anonymous death threats now. The Nawabians publish the name of his son, location of his son's school, a little bit fucked up. Uh, the Nawabians now to try to recruit the local NCAAP or NAACP, excuse me, chapter into their war against local officials, uh, which they, uh, uh, of course, constantly accuse of racism. Georgia Smith, who ran the local NAACP chapter at that time, disgusted by the Nuwabians, refuses to associate with them. Good for her. Meanwhile, York now purchases a $557,000 mansion in Athens, Georgia, about 60 miles away at the base of the University of Georgia, working on making another exit plan. Malik York, who'd left the cult in 1990, learns about his father's Tom Ray compound around 1998. Troubled by what he'd been hearing about their new beliefs and the continued abuse of followers, he goes to Georgia to confront his father. 
According to Malik, Dwight tells him, I don't believe in any of this shit. If I had to dress up like a nun, if I had to be a Jew, I'd do it for this type of money. I absolutely believe Dwight York said that. He doesn't buy this. He's not a spiritual man. He's a hustler, con artist. It's just a fucked up game for him. Malik now wants to shut his father down, but he doesn't know how. A little over a year later, Malik moves to Atlanta, where he'll become a moderately successful club promoter, and he'll put out the word that he will take in Nawabian refugees from a house or into a house he had rented in the Atlanta suburbs. With the help of his sister, Afifa, Malik now helps former cult members get driver's licenses, fill out job applications, and create resumes. Hail Malik! Doing some good shit here. September 25th, 1998, an important piece of mail begins the long process of bringing York to justice. That day, social welfare officials in Putnam County received the following anonymous letter. I read the article, Racial Legal Issues Cloud Egypt in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, dated Sunday, September 20th, 1998, concerning the Dwight York cult. I am an ex-member whom questioned the sick-minded and theocratic hold that Dwight has over the thoughts of his followers. Recently, Dwight has been becoming God himself to veteran members, subsequently exercising more divine rule to do whatever he wants to young girls below 16 years of age, young boys in the same age group, and a herd of concubines over a wide variety of ages that he stables on the property for free labor and sex. These facts, until very recently, were very closely guarded secrets. Even amongst the residents of the compound, few knew how often and with which adopted daughters York was having sex. Well, now they are pregnant. Some of the concubines are so young that his sexual perversions have surpassed being criminal. Because they are loyal to him, they may well deny these things, but science will not tell a lie. Children with children should be tested for paternity. Girls that are now 18 years old that have children more than five years old are examples of who Dwight York really is to the compound members, an abuser. Of course, the young girls who are not pregnant yet should be tested for sexual tampering. Children's services will surely find that they have been penetrated by a full-grown male. No men in the compound are allowed unsupervised communication with Dwight's concubines unless he is the law, an outsider that York has to impress or deceive, or a relative of the girls in question. Strangely enough, many support the abuse, and a very skillful line of questioning is necessary to first establish that there was not any prolonged, unsupervised exposure to any of the other compound's males that York may try it upon. His twisted affair will be unmasked. Once, when the GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, went to the compound, he was informed beforehand that they were coming, and busloads of young boys and girls were temporarily shipped to Macon, Georgia, to mask the overcrowding and rape. Please save these children. My ability has been exhausted from trying to advise some of these girls who have left the organization to speak up. We are afraid. We are alone. We need help. You know what? Fucking hail whoever wrote that letter. My God. Very well written to the point. And yes, he wasn't molesting boys now as well. Dude just kept pushing things further and further. No child on the compound safe from his sexual advances. Sheriff Sills knows this is not a random accusation. He knows uh, that it ha- it's been what, you know, it's, it's what he suspected has been going on for a while now. Uh, What he didn't know was that it would soon lead to the largest child molestation prosecution in U.S. history. In early 1999, Putnam County Attorney Frank Ford now files a civil suit on behalf of the county against the Nawabians. The suit asks for a moratorium on all construction activity on the Nawabians' property. Uh, Sills is, you know, trying to build a case before he goes in there. Uh, The judge asks Ford to prepare a list of everything the Nawabians needed to comply with zoning laws. He does, and the Nawabians just ignore it. They continue to build uh, legally. Uh, They persist in complaining that they're being harassed by white devils. How dare the evil white folks of Putnam County not let them have their own sovereign nation. And as Frank Ford persists in litigating against them, the Nawabian propaganda machine fires back at him with mixed success. A Nawabian attorney publishes a list of Ford's clients, implying that Ford's integrity was damaged because he represented people accused of crimes. Ford found the accusation funny. Yeah, of course he represented people accused of crimes. He worked primarily as a criminal defense attorney. They basically accused him of being the professional, uh, or being in the profession he was. Listen up, everybody. We have just discovered that this Pizza Hut delivery driver for the past six months has been delivering, get this, pizza. Dun, dun, dun. Geniuses. The Nawabians then threaten Ford. They distribute a flyer aimed at him. You hurt us, we're going to hurt you back. Soon after Ford's tires are slashed by Nawabian spokesman Bernard Foster, a rock is thrown through his office window, and a gutted dog, holy shit, is left in the street next to his house. So fucked up. Wasn't even his dog. It just gutted a random dog. Bojangles is growling, wants to bite York's dick off. Ford's law partner and wife, Dorothy Adams, now given police escorts to her car anytime she leaves the courthouse after dark. When she tries cases, Nawabians show up, and when she leaves the courtroom, she has to move through a crowd of people muttering threats at her. So for her birthday in 98, her husband buys her a gun. 1999, York tries to fight back with his own attorney, kind of. June 12th, 1999, Everett Leon Stout, who proclaimed himself a common law judge... (laughs) 
heads to the Putnam County Courthouse and files a document that resembles but is not quite a legal lawsuit. Because Stout is not quite a lawyer. He's a fucking lunatic who calls himself a common law judge. I found his Twitter account. (laughs) Huge conspiracy nut. Uh, He's a guy currently serving a 20-year prison sentence in Alabama for extortion. Uh, that He began his uh, prison sentence in 2016. He filed an appeal on his extortion case in May of 2020, and I found the court documents. Thank you, casetext.com. And check out a little tiny part of a sentence they wrote. The complaint is somewhat disjointed and rambling. Yep. Of course, this is the guy York hires. Stout's complaint lists 13 defendants, including Sills, Frank Ford, Dorothy Adams, several of Sills' officers. Something Stout calls the Electric and Power Company, even though there is no entity by that name in Putnam County. Guy's a fucking idiot. He's threatening to sue an organization that does not even exist. York really puts the legal A team on this case. Uh, Monday, June 21st, Georgia Circuit Court High Judge Hugh Wingfield publicly states he's had enough of Dwight York's bullshit. His hide-and-seek games, and when York doesn't show up to a contempt of court hearing about the zoning issues of, at Tamaray. Tamaray. Wingfield instructs York's fake attorney to have him be present the following Tuesday, June 29th, and if he doesn't show, he's going to be arrested and put in jail. In response, the Nawabians hold their own press conference, claiming they're being framed by white devils. Not long after this conference, they have their 1999 Savior's Day festival. And this is awesome. This fucking no one shows up. It's, it's shit. The crowds are small and depressed. <laughs> Things are crumbling for these morons. York then shows up on June 29th, appearing in the courtroom, wearing a black fez, all black outfit, accent with gold jewelry. Protesters as cult members are outside, getting drenched by a violent thunderstorm. Two hours later, York emerges to his followers and tells him he's taking a deal. Uh, essentially, it meant he would cooperate better with, con- with county officials. He legally now transfers the deed to Tom Array to nine of his followers, so the property won't be in his name. And the county can't, you know, prosecute him for future infractions. So I got to give him some props there. That's a pretty smart legal maneuver. Uh, He's avoided serious legal trouble for the moment. The following month, July of 1999, Time Magazine reports on the 40-foot high pyramids, obelisks, gods, goddesses, and a giant sphinx built by York's followers in rural Georgia in an article titled Space Invaders. Love it. The article written by Sylvester Monroe says, I am the lamb, I am the man, declares Dr. Malachi Z. York, 54, on his website. I am the supreme being of this day and time, God in flesh. And by the way, says the native of the planet Rizik, <laughs> a spaceship is coming on May 5th, 2003 to scoop up believers. The believers have been making quite a spectacle in the tiny town of Edenton, Georgia, seat of the not much larger Putnam County. There, the man born Dwight York of Sullivan County, New York, decreed the founding of Tamaray, Egypt of the West, a 19 acre evocation of the ancient land, complete with 40 foot high pyramids, obelisks, God, goddesses, and a giant sphinx. It is the holy sea of the Nuwabians. But don't call them a religion. The Nawabians describe themselves as a fraternal organization of people of different religions, including Christians, Muslims, and others who just happen to share a few extra tenets. Says Marshall Chance, head of the Nawabians Holy Tabernacle Ministries, the main thing that brings us together is fellowship and facts. Among those facts, that black people are genetically superior to whites, and that the Nawabians are direct descendants of Egyptians, who, having walked from the Nile Valley to the Americas, long ass walk, before continental drift separated the land masses, are actually the original Native Americans. York and several hundred of his followers wandered from New York to Georgia in 1993, buying up 476 acres of land on the perimeter of Edenton for $575,000. And now as a tribe of Native Americans, the Nuwabians believe they can argue for being a sovereign people not subject to local or state jurisdiction. Then Sylvester describes how the local government is not about to let this happen. In the same article, the Nuwabians criticize various local officials, including County Commissioner Sandra Adams, who the Nuwabians call a house and bomb the Nuwabians make ridiculously false statements about her, saying that her daughter was half white, the product of an illicit affair with a white man. Adams laughs at that because her daughter's complexion, she's married to a, she's black, she's married to a black man, and her daughter's complexion is quite dark. Adams reflected later, they really hated me. They thought because I was black, I should automatically jump on their bandwagon. But to her, it was just about following the law. And she said, buddy, if I want to put a porch on the back of my house, I have to get a permit just like everybody else. Love this lady. Howard Sills says to Time Journalist that he fears that young people are being held against their will at Tomaray. No one in Georgia has ever dealt with anything like this, he says. You only draw parallels to Waco. And I don't want a Waco. This is a cult. A Nawabian spokesman hits back at this idea, saying there is no one being held on Tomaray against their will. No one is allowed to move to Tomaray that is under 18. The children that are here belong to grown adults who have made the choice to be Nawabians. Nawabians are insulted when they are confronted with accusations that they are brainwashed or being told by one man what to do. Uh, you are here on the land, one Nawabian man says pointedly to a reporter on Tom Array. Do you see a cult or a compound? We're just people who have come together in love and peace. Well, the article fuels fear the locals already have 
about the Nuwabians. Fall of 1999, Reverend Al Sharpton, the New York activist who would later make an unsuccessful run for the presidency in 2004, speaks at Tom Array, denouncing what he calls the harassment of the Nuwabians. Fucking Al Sharpton, another black supremacist. Dude said so much racist shit over the years. He's also worked as an FBI informant, ratted on fellow civil rights advocates, and according to the New York Times, Sharpton and his for-profit businesses owe uh, over $4.5 million in state and federal taxes as of November 2014. Uh, dude manipulates people who believe he's working on behalf of African Americans into keeping him rich. Like York, a dude who points at the white devil and then steals from his fellow African Americans, in my opinion. A charlatan. Uh, in 2000, the Nawabians try and take over Putnam County at the polls. Nawabians register to run for every local office, including sheriff. Uh, their candidate for sheriff is actually quickly disqualified because he, he doesn't live there. <laughs> uh, Marion Tanner, acting as a county registrar, notes that about 150 registered voters who were Nawabians had registered under false pretenses, like listing 28 people living at the same address. There was a court hearing over the removal of the, of the voters. The Nawabians showed up to protest, claiming this was a violation of their civil rights. Of course, they couldn't produce any documentary evidence to say they lived at the addresses they claimed to. The judge ruled in favor of Putnam County in 120 out of 100. 50 of, of the disqualifications. Uh, the Nuwabians are, you know, more pissed. Meanwhile, around 2000, Ramilla, a little girl, secretly escapes Tom Array with the help of her father, Assad, who had left the cult years earlier. And when he picked her up, he noticed something was wrong. Soon he overheard her talking about the abuse she suffered at the hands of York, takes her to the Orlando office of the FBI. It would be Ramilla's testimony that would start the wave of children and adults confessing what Dwight York had done to them. The Savior's Day Festival in 2000, even a bleaker affair, in the 1999 festival, less people show up. Dwight York now fighting authorities in Athens who are trying to get him to stop constructing illegally. He just can't stop <laughs> not getting permits. Uh, he tries to start up something in Macon, Georgia now. His ver version of a Masonic Lodge, something called the International Supreme Council of Shriners. He just fucking keeps changing things and moving around. April 2001, Reverend Jesse Jackson shows up. Presidential candidate in 1998. He comes to Tom Array to also talk Dwight York up, extol his virtues. Fucking Jesse Jackson! Talking to a dude who's been aggressively racist for so long. And Jackson knows that. That's a fucking dick move. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, 2001, Dwight's son Malik now drives with a group of five former Nawabian women for a weekend in Miami. In Miami, the group tells him what had happened to them during their time in the cult. A short time later, Sheriff Howard Sills picks up the phone, hears the man say, I know the whole deal on York. I'm ready to tell everything. The man identifies himself as the son of Dwight York. Hail Nimrod, and here we go. The two would meet the next day at the FBI offices in Atlanta. Malik brings a woman who'd uh, been one of York's favorite concubines, Bashira. Bashira had been born into the cult, and at the age of 13, this poor child had been ushered into York's room for her first sexual experience. The older woman who was training her was performing oral sex on York when she walked in. York snapped at Bashira to come do what the older woman was doing. Uh, York demanded, am I just a guinea pig here? You're just sitting there, you know? Take your shirt off. Don't be scared. I'm not going to bite you. She would eventually have two children by York. Fucking predator. Her story, uh, the name she gave, the details of everything that happened to her, it gave Sills so much ammo to start building a bigger case against York. The floodgates are opening. Two female FBI agents now, Joan Cronier, based in Atlanta, Jelaine Ward, based in Macon, they start interviewing more former members. They do it slowly and discreetly, worried that word's going to get out and York's going to flee, make it to Africa or someplace. They want to build a slam dunk case against this slippery son of a bitch. Victims tell them shit like how York, uh, when they were children, would tell them they were going to go to heaven if they'd have, if he'd have, uh, if they'd have sex with him. A girl named uh, Ariba was asked how many children she witnessed having sex with York, and she replied, everyone. She listed about 20 names. She'd been coerced into having group sex with children as young as seven or eight. It is eight years old. A girl named Jokar had been exposed to pornography. Once she moved to Georgia, York started having anal sex with her. Jokar's brother, Rafiq, also used in York sex games. York's concubines took him into a room when he was around eight years old, started performing oral sex on him. When York came into the room, he undressed and watched... After the move to Georgia, older boys started approaching him, touching him sexually. He performed a variety of sex acts with York, concubines, older boys, all kinds of shit before he was, uh, or when he was eight years old. What the fuck? He's molested everybody. In late 2001, York still has no idea the law is about to shut him down. He's still scheming. Uh, he books a banquet room at a fancy Manhattan hotel that year and invites a group of his biological children, children to a dinner party. One of his daughters, now working with Malik to rescue victims secretly, a FIFA, she goes, it turns out the dinner was a ploy where he just asked his children for money. He was having some, some cash problems. He wanted to pick up with them and start over and just, you know, have them give him a bunch of money. Uh, he tells his children, whoever gives the most money will be in control. Uh, you know, like as in uh, the cult when, he, when he's gone. And then after the dinner, he tells his daughter, daughter of FIFA, you'll have to sleep your way to the top. What the fuck? She leaves. This guy related to Fred West. 
In the spring of 2002 now, investigations by federal officials on York continue to ramp. They're being very careful because of Waco. Had the feds not received so much backlash for the raid on Waco, they would have, been, they would have already raided Tom Murray. Officials start planning to arrest York, raid his compound in a way that will avoid a deadly siege or standoff. Putnam County inspectors have been turned away by armed Nawabian guards in the past, so it's possible the situation will escalate if they don't handle it properly. May 8, 2002, York and his most trusted wife, Kathy Johnson, finally arrested off the Tom Array property on four counts of transporting minors across state lines for the purpose of illegal sex. Hail Nimrod, you piece of shit. Authorities waited for them to drive off the compound before nabbing them secretly, and then later that day, before his followers could figure out what the fuck was going on, 300 law enforcement officers including agents of the FBI, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, several local sheriff's departments. They all stormed the compound, meeting no resistance. It's fucking big time, right? They got like, you know, major uh, assault vehicles going in through the main gate. They got helicopters, people fucking propelling on cables down from that. Uh, You know, they're showing a big, big show of force, not fucking around. They planned this for months. FBI agents quickly distribute food and water to malnourished Nawabians once inside. They find a stockpile of guns, uh, the sexually explicit Pink Panther doll, uh, a suitcase of cash in York's chambers, so many dildos, vibrators, fucking child porn, everything. They also find five children who were taken into state custody because they've been named as possible victims. Four of the kids later found out uh, had STDs already. The law enforcement officers had been terrified of another Waco, but it was a flawless raid. Most of the officers home before dark. On May 16th, 2002, a federal level case charged York with racketeering, transporting children across state lines for the purpose of sexual intercourse. The case was built on four trips to Disney World. Fucking Disney got him. Good job, Roy Disney. The Florida Georgia state line being the operative sex trafficking boundary. York's attorney was Ed Garland, one of Atlanta's best known defense attorneys. For uh, some reason, he didn't use Everett, Everett Leon Stout again. That's weird. He didn't use that fucking common judge or whatever nonsense title he had. Uh, maybe he was unavailable because he was probably in prison. Uh, bond for York is denied. The Putnam County Grand Jury convenes in the summer of 2002. In a separate state case, York is indicted by a grand jury on 120 counts. 74 counts of child molestation, 29 counts of aggravated child molestation, one count of rape. Later, when more witnesses come forward, the counts are amended to a total of 177. The case was actually much, much more massive, as I mentioned earlier, but be- uh, because molestation had been going on for years, but they didn't want the jury to have to deal with so many cases it would seem made up. Also, hundreds of additional cases would bog down the legal proceedings for years. Dude had literally committed too many evil acts for the court system to be able to properly process in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, Defense attorney Ed Garland tries to get York a plea deal. In the deal, York will plead guilty to 77 state charges on January 24th, 2003, day after pleading guilty to a pair of federal charges in exchange for a 15-year sentence that will account for both state and federal charges. York pleads guilty. Uh, you know, the deal was supposed to get him out by the age of 70 if it went through, but then U.S. District Court Judge Hugh Lawson, who received the report about the sentencing, was like, fuck that shit. He decided the deal was simply too good, and he rejected it, calling for a hearing in July. Hail Hugh Lawson. Lawson also rejected y- uh, York's plea to be returned for trial to his own quote-unquote tribe after York claimed status as an indigenous person, which he is not. He said, Your Honor, with all due respect, <laughs> with all due respect to your government, your nation, and your court, We, the indigenous people of this land, have our own right. He's not. Oh, my God. Uh, We have our own rights, accepted sovereign, our own governments. We are a sovereign people. The Yamasee, Native American Creek, Seminole, Mound Builders. He's none of that. (laughs) All I'm asking is that the court recognize that I'm an indigenous person. Your court does not have jurisdiction over me. I should be transferred to the Moores Cherokee Council Court, in which I will get a trial by juries of my peers. I cannot get a fair trial, Your Honor, if I'm being tried by the settlers or the Confederates. I have to be tried by Native Americans as a Native American. That's my inalienable rights. It's on record. And the judge is like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> the judge pays it no attention because it's all nonsense. Oh my God. He would had his followers uh, buy his insane bullshit for so long. He thought the court might buy it too. I love when these idiots end up in court because they've been in their weird echo chamber for so long. They don't understand that other people don't easily buy their fucking stupid lies. Reminds me of Daniel Perez, AKA Lou Castro, when he got tried for his angels landing cult bullshit. Uh, York's main wife, Kathy Johnson, does get a plea bargain agreement in exchange for testimony against York. She gets only two years in prison, even though there was strong evidence she committed child molestation, had procured children for sex with York, and had instructed children on sexual techniques. I hope wherever she is right now, she is fucking suffering. Fuck Kathy. Uh, York's trial begins on January 13th, 2004. U.S. District Court Judge Ashley Royal bars spectators from the courtroom, doesn't want to deal with New Wabian bullshit. Uh, the first witness called is a woman named Chakara. She's 19. She tells a story of the first time York molested her when she was eight. 
Prosecution shows a picture of Jakara taken at her eighth birthday party. York's trial attorney, who is now Adrian Patrick, he's burning through attorneys because, you know, he's insane, uh, tries to discredit Jakara, a pattern that would continue through the first week of trial into the second week of trial. Some of the witnesses, including Bashira, have been in charge of some of Dwight's business ventures, and they could testify to scams he was running. All the cash from the Savior's Day festivals, she says, uh, are treated as York's birthday present and go straight to him, not the cult. Uh, Bashir also confirms that York had been planning a political takeover of Putnam County. Uh, Badra, who worked in York's finance department, testified that York had what amounted to slaves. His income averaged uh, about a million dollars annually from 96 to 2002, and he never paid his workers a penny. After trying to discredit the witnesses, uh, Adrian Patrick tried to do some really odd math to show how everyone must have been lying. Everyone's lying. He said the math worked out to 150 molestations per month, three or four a day. No normal middle-aged man would be capable of that much sex, he argued. And the prosecution said, yeah, they're right. You're right. Dwight York, not a normal man. He's a fucking monster. They reported how police found evidence he was taking a ton of testosterone. After a three-week trial, the jury went to deliberate. They, uh, they're in the room for about seven hours, and they convicted Dwight York on every single count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here comes the justice, you piece of shit. In uh, April sentencing, York is convicted to a 135-year sentence for transporting minors. You know, again, all, I've already mentioned the, the, uh, the crimes. After all this, some of his followers incredibly continue to support him. Certain factions of the black supremacist subculture in the U.S. appear to support him today still, portraying his conviction as a conspiracy by the white power structure. Malik Zulu Shabazz, chairman of the New Black Panther Party, uh, one of York's many, many lawyers, described York as a great leader of our people, a victim of an open conspiracy by our enemy. Ah, oh, Malik, you don't seem like a very smart person. Uh, November 10th, 2004, Dwight writes a letter to his followers from prison. Of course, he admits responsibility for nothing. He keeps blaming the white devils. In the letter he writes, the Caucasian has not been chosen to lead the world. They lack true emotions in their creation. <laughs> Remember that they're, they're, you know, they're jackal babies. Uh, we never intended them to be peaceful. Because, <laughs> you know, we made them. They were bred to be killers with low reproduction levels and a short lifespan. What you call Negroid, no one says that word, but you, New York, was to live a thousand years each and the other humans 120 years. But the warrior seed of Caucasians is only six years old. They were only created to fight other invading races, to protect the God race, Negroids. What is he talking about? But they went insane, lost control when they were left unattended. <laughs> He's writing this like it's a legal letter. But they were never to taste blood. They did, and their true nature came out. Because of the reproduction levels were cut short, their sexual organs were made the smallest. He's even sneaking a little dick joke in there. Come on, got little dicks, you know? So the females of their race want to breed with Negroids to breed themselves out of existence after 6,000 years. It took 600 years to breed them, part man, and part beast. Fucking what? I guess it's not a legal letter. Sorry, I most misspoke. It's a letter to his followers from, but what is, why? Decades of pamphlet book writing and he still can't just write a single paragraph that just makes sense. Uh, he tries to appeal, of course. His case is appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which upheld convictions on October 7th, 27th, excuse me, 2005. 200 Nawabian protesters, God, they still follow him, demonstrate in Atlanta to show their support. U.S. Supreme Court appeal is then denied June 2006. You'd think at this point the Nawabians would be done, right? Their leaders in prison, exhausted appeals, exposed to fraud, child molester, child molester. Uh, but instead, like cult members do, they just keep rationalizing everything, often in very interesting ways. York's followers have asserted a number of defenses, some of them very creative, including that their leader, Malachi Z. York, who was charged and convicted, is not the same person as Dwight D. York. Listed in court documents as the defendant. One of York's sons is named Dwight, and sometimes the claim is made that it's York's son, not York who should be the real defendant. His son did all this and everyone's mistaken. They got the wrong guy. Others say that York was set up by his son, Jacob, in coordination with Al-Qaeda-linked American mosques, jealous of York's influence among black Muslims. Uh-huh. That's why all those girls testified against him. Another claim was that since 1999, York has been a consul general of Monrovia, Liberia, under appointment from then president, Charles Taylor. They argue he should be given diplomatic immunity from prosecution and extradited as a persona non grata to Liberia. And officials have not accepted this claim, obviously. 2009, Nawabians tried to get York out of jail by sending false documents to his maximum security prison. As if the people who were working there were just going to read it and be like, oh, fuck, oh, we got the wrong guy. Let him out. <laughs> uh, August 26, they just threw him in the trash. August 26, 2009, 300 people congregate at a federal courthouse in Macon, Georgia to support yet another appeal. So I guess he didn't exhaust all of them, filed to get York out of jail. As recently as 2018, then 74-year-old York, uh, still up to his old tricks, December 14, 2018, news outlets report that Dwight D. York filed a lawsuit in Macon's U.S. District Court demanding compensation from various government agencies. His three-page suit argues that he is a Native American. 
<laughs> as if 23andMe doesn't exist. And the, U the U.S. legal system has no jurisdiction over him. Dude just won't quit. He writes, I am not or never have been part of this corporate state or their judicial system. The reason I'm asking for the amount of money damages is because I think a message should be sent to everyone in North America. What are you even talking about there? Like, <laughs> it's, not, it was one, it's not one big country. That you should not rape, murder, pillage, or do treason, sedition, involuntarily, involuntary servitude, slavery, terrorism, fraud, extortion, grand theft, robbery, conspiracy, and racketeering against a Native American moor. His law cites an 1871 law that allows people to sue local governments for civil rights violations. I, and he says, I'm looking for compensation from Title 42, Statute 1983, in the amount of $2 billion. <laughs> ah, $2 billion. I wonder if any part of him thought he might get that. Like, is he that fucking crazy? Probably. They're going to be like, all right, York, <laughs> you found Title 42, Statute 1983. You, good job, buddy. We didn't think you could do it. You're free to go. Uh, there's $2 billion that have been deposited in your account. Happy kid fucking, you son of a bitch. Ah, York submitted several attachments as a lawsuit, including several documents arguing that he's not under jurisdiction of U.S. law, a form granting power of attorney to a Michigan man in a manila folder simply marked you have 20 days to comply. I'm sure officials were like, oh, we gotta hurry and answer the York. We only have 20 days. As defendants, his suit names the Macon County Police Department, which doesn't exist as an agency under that name, uh, Bibb County, State of Georgia, FBI, and unidentified Sheriff's Department, just, you know, whatever Sheriff's Department happens to be around there, and Judge Royal, who has nothing to do with uh, the case. <sighs> no trial date has been set for <laughs> York's lawsuit because it's insane. As of 2020, Dwight York is serving a sentence at the U.S. Penitentiary Administrative Maximum Facility in Florence, Colorado. Inmate number 17911-054, that's his new name. His projected release date is July 12th, 2120. I don't think he's going to make it. Let's get out of here. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Dwight York, huh? God, what is happening in this story? What a massive piece of shit. Convicted pedophile, cult leader, master manipulator, religious despot, you know, guy who dicked around with R&B, disco. Uh, using people who've been shut out of the American dream for legitimate racism, the kind that was actually experienced in the 60s during the civil rights movement, turning that into a philosophy of black supremacy and hatred that meant everyone had to follow his crazy, constantly changing, nonsensical rules to live in a peaceful, separate community, and his community would be anything but peaceful. In the beginning, it would be the Ansar Allah community, an Islamic organization headquartered in Bushwick, where playing on authorities, giving protection for Muslim groups and being one of the only peaceful appearing communities in the area, Dwight got free license to make people live practically in slavery, working long hours selling books and incense on the streets. Many were being sexually abused way back then. He was already having sex with whoever he wanted, basically. He was trying to launch a music career as well and espousing his insane philosophy and his weird pamphlet books, some of which were hundreds of pages long. Dwight would then move operations to Camp Jazeera in the Catskill Mountains, where the pedophilia would really ramp up. He brought vans of backstreet girls to his upstate property for underage orgies. Then in the 90s, he moves to Putnam County, Georgia, as his followers build a weird Egyptian-themed compound called Tom Array for their cult leader, who now talked a lot about being an alien. And uh, he got really into thinking he was Native American. In Georgia, York would finally be brought down by Sheriff Howard Sills, thanks to his son Malik. Thank you, Malik! Exposing Daddy Dwight for the child-molesting piece of shit lunatic he was. He molested hundreds of kids, hundreds, many of those his own that he had had with mothers he had also molested his kids. Despite these crimes, some Nawabians, some of them active on Facebook and other sites today, continue to petition for his release. They bought the message of white devils stopping at nothing to bring him down. It didn't matter to them what York had been accused of. It didn't matter how many people testified, right? It's like a uh, fucking QAnon shit. People get so deep into it, it doesn't matter what you say to them. It's all uh, white devils. I imagine uh, many of them will die still believing York was framed. He was not. He was a disgusting child predator, even though he now sits alone in his cell for 23 hours a day with one hour of recreation time, and even though he will die in prison, he's still getting far better treatment than he deserves, in my opinion. I hope, just because of his belief system, I hope all of his guards that deal with him are white. Uh, thankfully, Tom Array is no longer. Uh, the place where so many people were held against their will has been turned to dust, and those who once lived there continue to deal with the trauma of what York did to them as they try to heal. I watched an interview of a woman who joined York's cult when she was 19, Clearly a highly intelligent, strong, beautiful woman. She talked about how initially in Bushwick, visions of a black messiah spoke to her in a way that a sea of illustrations of a white messiah and white prophets never did. She started attending AAC meetings. Inspired by the messages of black pride that York shared, she'd been the victim of racism as a child growing up. She was angry at white America and York preyed on her anger and twisted it into sexually preying on her. And she welcomed his, welcomed his attention 
sexual and otherwise at first, but then she heard about what he might be doing to children. Then she saw that. She watched an eight-year-old child go into hysterics after being molested by York. She said she'd never seen someone that upset before or since. She left the cult, but she wasn't able to take the girl with her. And the memory of that girl, knowing what was continuing to happen to that girl, fucking haunted her. She'd go on to become part of the investigation that took York down. Years later, in 2019, she spoke of how hard it still is for her to come to terms with the fact that she had been in a cult, in York's cult. She said it took years of therapy to get comfortable with admitting she had been in a cult. She hates that word. She kept saying she was part of a community. How could she consider herself strong and intelligent if she'd fallen for that bullshit if she'd been a cult member? She still struggles to trust people today, I bet, to have a healthy romantic relationship. These types of struggles are what York has left hundreds to deal with. That's his legacy. One of pain and destruction, confusion. Also his fucked up ego and deranged sexual appetite could constantly be fed. No one is who York claimed to be. Some godlike person, some prophet, some messiah, fucking no one. Everyone in recent memory who's made these claims have proven themselves to be con artists, criminals. Everyone who made these claims centuries, uh, centuries ago can never be properly fact-checked. Anyone tries to pull that shit with you, if you're interested in my opinion and advice at all about this, run the fuck away as fast uh, as you can from them every single time. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Dwight York changed up whatever costumery, religious ideology, or crazy origin story he needed to maintain control over his cult. Over the years, he tried out Islam, uh, cowboys, <laughs> spaceships. Uh, basically anything that he thought he could get his followers to buy, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and would help sell his shitty pamphlet books and keep peddling his philosophies. Uh, he built an elaborate empire in cities across the U.S. selling his insane philosophies, including that he was an alien from the planet Rizik. And he didn't believe any of it. It was all a front. He told his son Malik that he would do anything, dress up like a nun, convert to Judaism, whatever it took to keep hold over his people and keep the money flowing in. Number two, the Nawabians did everything in their power to try and take over Putnam County, including attempting to vote out officials who oppose them. They even left a dead dog as a warning on Frank Ford Street. Number three, D Dwight York used a dildoed stuffed pink panther toy as a sex toy for children. How the fuck is that a true sentence? Number four, a murder case possibly related to Dwight York and the AAC took place in 1979 when Roy Savage, and man, Roy was savage, murdered Horace Green and went on to kill two of his wives in Newark, stuffed their bodies in suitcases in front of one of his other wives' daughters. Savage was a member of York's inner circle, continued to pledge his devotion to York from behind bars. Too bad those two can't be cellmates today. And number five, some new info. Three of York's fellow prisoners at the Supermax facility in Florence, Colorado are people we've already covered in previous sucks. Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, uh, Sinaloa cartel leader, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, and Oklahoma City bombing co-conspirator Terry Nichols. Former suck subject, now recently dead, thank you, God, former serial killer Joseph Duncan, also spent time at Supermax. Hopefully York will be a former inmate soon as well. Uh, maybe El Chapo can get him killed. One can hope. Crazier shit has happened. York's life proves that. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The insanity of Dwight York has been sucked. My God, what a story. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making time suck. I'll have to get some therapy after this week. Uh, Queen of Bad Magic, uh, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Sophie Fact Sorceress Evans for running point again on this week's research. She's going to need some therapy about this too. Uh, Bit Elixir for continuously refining the Time Suck app. Logan Art Warlock Keith running badmagicmerch.com, working on our socials along with Liz Hernandez, uh, and for being the visual artist for all things Bad Magic. Thanks to all those who've joined the new Cult of the, Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, currently Cult of the Curious 2. Uh, thanks to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes running our Facebook page. Uh, there's also Beefsteak and his mod squad running Discord. So many places to find new friends. Uh, next time on Time Suck, we're going to head back to the hyperinflation ravaged era of pre-Nazi Germany to once again investigate a uniquely brutal German serial killing psychopath. So many in Germany. Uh, this time it's a man nicknamed the Vampire of Dusseldorf, Peter Curtin. He was also called the King of Sexual Perverts by a number of behavior experts when he was caught. And there's no doubt as to why after looking into just a few minutes of research on this guy, and I promise when I picked these recent episodes, I did not realize that so many of them would be so sexually deviant. I know it's been a lot. Uh, Peter attacked dozens of innocent people, mainly women and often children, killing at least 10, striking fear into the whole country. Also went pretty hard into bestiality. Pun uh, not intended, but acknowledged. Uh, with a countless number of farm animals, good Lord. Newspapers and their readers were shocked at this inhuman monster's sheer brutality. They were horrified to learn that some of his victims were toddlers. Peter Curtin wasn't a vampire, but he was a monster. 
He was obviously a fatally flawed man motivated, motivated by an intense sexual desire to see blood gush and squirt out of victims' bodies. Holy horror. He would revel in his crimes to almost unheard of extremes, not only returning to the scenes of his crimes to hear people talk about them, he would even go to the cemeteries and ejaculate on his victims' grave sites. What the fuck? More what the fuck next week? Tough to get more depraved than this horrible waste of elements. He also somehow had a wife that he cared for deeply and didn't brutally murder, who was unaware of his crimes until the end. Even some of the worst monsters out there have places in their hearts that are not totally dead or evil. Does that make them more or less scary? Even after he admitted to being the vampire of Dusseldorf, he presented a nice plan to help her. Join us next Monday as we grab some torches and pitchforks and hunt down the vampire of Dusseldorf. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Military meat sack Nicole White called out a mistake of mine from last, uh, last episode, Operation Greenup. Allow me to share and explain. Nicole writes, Dearest Master Sucker, first time writing, long time listener, uh, but I've been compelled to write a few times. However, it took you butchering my favorite airplane during the Real and Glorious Bastard episode suck to write. You see, I'm in the military and ironically am a bombardier on the long flying B-52, or as we call it, big, ugly, fat fucker. And unfortunately for your fact checking, the wonderful buff was not in fact flying during World War II. In fact, it took his first flight in 1952, well after Hitler decided he didn't want to live anymore and graciously ridded us of his presence. Today, we have approximately 80 still in flight, tails built from 1958 to 1962, or 61, possibly 62, and keep bringing them back from the boneyard on a fairly regular basis. Sorry, not sorry for the long post. Love the podcast. To the bucks, those who know will know your faithful space lizard, Nicole. Well, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate your service. Thank you for that. Yes, you, Tim, and uh, a chanter, numerous other suckers also called out this correction. Let me explain. That detail was a last minute addition. The B-52 came, uh, you know, reference came from the only source I could find that listed what type of plane Mayer, Winberg, and Weber uh, jumped out of behind enemy lines. And since I'm not a military bomber historian, when I read B-52, it just didn't set off any red flags. So sorry for missing uh, that one. Uh, thanks for the correction. You know I strive for accuracy. Doing further research, I'm guessing the guys were actually dropped from a Douglas C-47. You would know better than me, but uh, that was introduced in 1941, maybe from B-17, introduced in 1938. Also could have jumped from the C-47 variant, the C-53 Skytrooper. Sources don't say. Uh, thank you for that correction. Uh, now onto a cool memory dredged up by the Operation Green Up Suck. Sent in by Thoughtful Sack, Peter Caracos. Peter writes, I'm listening to the Operation Green Up Suck, and in regards to the OSS, when I was a cable technician, I went to a house for service, and when I was in the basement, there was a table in the middle of the floor. On the table was a photograph that was on poster board. The photograph was a group of people in an area that I did not know, and it was in black and white. When I finished with what I needed to do, I asked the couple of the house about the picture. The wife told me that was her husband's platoon in World War II. Turns out he was an original member of the OSS. He was sent in Italy or into Italy to assist with stopping Mussolini. To this day, there's not a cooler person that I have ever met. He was about 98 years old at the time. This was around 10 years ago, so he's probably no longer with us, unfortunately. Sadly, many from his generation are no longer with us. I wish I had taken down his personal information and stayed in contact. It hurts to this day knowing that I can't learn any more from him than I did in the 45 minutes I was in his house. I love this message, Peter. Yes, almost no one from that war is with us any longer. If you're lucky enough to meet anyone who has a story to share about what they experienced in World War II, listen. Those stories will not be told face-to-face -face by those who lived through them very much longer. Uh, their living history will be gone. What an incredible generation. Glad you got to hear what you did. If anyone from that generation happens to be listening, uh, sorry for all the crazy words. And also, thank you so much for fucking everything. Thank you. Thanks for saving the whole world from tyranny. Uh, now for a quick message from Commando fan Brandon Mitchell that just cracked me up. Brandon writes, hello there, ma hello there Master Sucker. I just listened to your most recent suck about the Inglorious Bastards. Great episode. I'm an avid, thank you. I'm an avid Arnold fan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I totally knew you were talking about the movie Commando. I've seen that movie hundreds of times. <laughs> I know the characters. You mentioned Matrix and his daughter Jenny. I knew it. You called it. Hail Nimrod. Three out of five stars. Uh, yes, thank you, Brandon. I love it. I just hope that that would hit with someone. And I'm glad it did. I loved that movie as a kid. Uh, when I think of Commando, I always think about the scene where Arnold runs into like that tool shed. Excuse me. He gets surrounded by five guys with machine guns firing into the shed. They like unload their guns almost, or, you know, basically. Then he pops out, opens the door, stabs one dude with a pitchfork, which is not real, you know, practical. And then he throws two skill saw blades, like he's playing some murderous version of Frisbee golf, less practical. Hits both of them in their heads. Then he grabs an axe. He has a lot of time for this while everybody's standing around. Chops one dude in the nuts. <laughs> then somehow has a machete in his hand out of nowhere. 
and f- chops the fifth guy's arm off. It's one of the most ridiculous action sequences I've ever seen, and I love it. So hail Nimrod. And now a Shaka Zulu update from South African Sack Simone Stridum. Simone writes, dearest, most honorable leader of suckness, I am so fortunate to have found the suck. Thank you. I'm a South African female meat sack and thoroughly enjoyed your suck on Shaka Zulu. I realize this message uh, comes ages after you did the episode, but I reckoned, meh, chances are 50-50 you see this, so I apologize if someone has mentioned this, but here goes. I'm not going to bother with correcting you on pronunciation. I would love to share some extra info, though, regarding the Zulu and all the tribes here using cattle as currency. As Lucifina sees fit, when a boy Zulu loves a girl Zulu, he goes to her father and goes, yo, I dig your sperm art. <laughs> Can I hit that? And dad would be like, how many cows you got? So in order for a couple to get married, even in very modern times, the male either needs to offer either cattle or money. The more heads of cattle they can offer for a daughter, the more likely he will win the favor of the bride's family. This is a tradition that is very much alive and well in South Africa. Anywho, fucking love you, your queen, and your fellow sucking ears. You get me through my days in this, our own apocalypse. I could go into private shit, but I shan't. Just keep being the suck we deserve. <laughs> I spread your filthy knowledge as far as wide as I can. Love and suckness. Simone, if, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, love and suckness, Simone. If this gets read, I will never ask Bojangles for anything again. Well, praise Bojangles, Simone. He has heard your prayers. I love hearing what you just shared. The cattle trading continues. I mean, kind of super fucked up. It boils down to women being traded for cattle. Uh, but interesting, the tradition continues. I guess maybe it's good that dads are hoping to see their daughters taken care of by, you know, hardworking dudes with plenty of cow money. I'm going to choose to see that bit of good. Uh, I hope I make it back to South Africa again someday. I love your beautiful country so much. And now one more message from educated sucker John Fossey. John writes from across the pond, recently found the podcast, listened to about 40% of the back catalog and most of the recent ones, loving the mispronounced English place names, uh, e.g. Fred and Rosemary West episode. Anything ending in Shire should be sha, sha, not Shire. We are not hobbits. I love the hobbits reference. Uh, Wiltshire with two syllables, not three syllables. And it's not Wiltshire. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> Gotten a lot of these messages recently. I'm learning, which I love. One of the things I love about this. John continues, uh, since listening out of sequence, this may have already been covered, but in episode 40, Nostradamus, uh, you call out poo gazing is not medically valid. Well, check out this Bristol poo chart, which developed in Bristol, the UK in the early 90s, 1990s as a diagnostic tool. I'm not a medical doctor, but do know that stool inspection can be diagnostic. And in those days, without much else to go on, if your turds are runny and yellow, it might mean there's something wrong with you. Best regards, Professor John S. Fossey. Well, thank you, Professor Fossey. Uh, thank you for the link to the poo chart. Link is in the episode uh, notes if anyone wants to find it. Uh, I found out, you know, reading your poo chart that you sent me, not that you wrote it, but that there are seven types of poo and that two are normal types. Category three, a sausage shape with cracks on the surface. <laughs> and category four, a smooth, soft sausage or snake. <laughs> Anything else, you're a little bit fucked up to some degree. At quick glance, looking at the poo chart, I could use some more fiber. Appreciate the poo info. Love some unexpected knowledge. Thanks, uh, everyone, for all the messages sent in this week. Let's get out of here. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Please don't build an Egyptian, alien, Islamic uh, cult compound and molest hundreds of kids this week. It's pretty fucked up. And maybe don't record any R&B disco tracks either. Just, you know, just keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Hey, Lindsay, could you come in here for a second? Yeah. Hey, um, I just got done with this, uh, this suck on this guy, this Dr. York and his cult, and a lot of stuff is crazy. Mm-hmm. But some of the stuff kind of spoke to me. Like and, what? Like, I was just, what do you think about a harem? Excuse me? It's just like a harem of wives. What if it's God's plan and the Egyptian aliens have decreed it? I don't think so. He makes it seem so easy. And the Wabian bullshit's harder to pull off than it looks. Gosh dang. <laughs>